So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you from different parts of the world. Uh, we will be waiting a few minutes while everybody joins us uh, before we just start with some housekeeping and introduction. So let's just pause for a few minutes. So let's just start and say that the International Federation of Surveyors, FIG, Climate Compass Task Force, welcomes you to our third regional seminar and Climate Compass Task Force annual meeting of a four-year series on surveying and climate. Two seminars, three sem these three seminars are being held across the three major global time zones to reach all surveyors interested in climate, no matter where around the world. And this seminar um, is focused on the Americas and Africa and Europe. We have one more seminar. Sorry, this is our final and third seminar. These interactive seminars are about regionally relevant uh, case studies showing opportunities and gaps for surveying and climate. So I'm Clarissa Augustinus, and I co-chair this FIG task force together with Roshni Sharma. And the two of us will be co-chairing and facilitating this seminar today, also with our backup facilitators and team. We represent both sides of the task force, young surveyors and seasoned surveyors. And I'm an honorary FIG ambassador and have supported the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. And I now represent FIG, on the FAO uh, UNCCD Joint Partnership Initiative on Land Tenure and Land Degradation Neutrality. Roshni works for Frontier SI, an innovative Australian geospatial company, and is on the Geospatial Council of Australia. The purpose of this seminar is to bring together surveyors with an interest in climate from around the world to map our expertise so we can help to catalyze a better future for the people and the planet. So let's just do a, a little bit of housekeeping next. So we invite you to already start introducing yourself and your organization in the chat. And please put into the chat links of items you think are useful or interesting for this audience about any aspect of surveying and climate. And we can also you see, we can also potentially use this information for the upcoming planned FIG publication. Please keep your microphones off until we start the, uh, the, the panel question and answer time. Um, and also uh, we ask that you would put questions in the chat as well. Uh, it, these will be picked up by our team and by Roshni. So uh, please, please start doing that as soon as the speaking, speakers start. Um, our, our team of facilitators and Roshni will review them and use them both in the session for as we have a panel and, and also in the plenary session to follow. Once we start the interactive plenary session, please keep your video and microphone on and use the Zoom raise hand feature at the bottom of the screen together with the chat box for questions. And that way you will enter the queue for questions. We really want to hear your voice. That's the intention of this seminar. Apologies, the seminar is only in English and all the questions, whether written or spoken, need to be in English. The seminar and task force meeting will be four hours long and is recorded. The seminar will take place for three and a half hours, followed by a half an hour task force meeting to which everybody is invited. And if you want, you're welcome to join the task force. After the, the seminar, the recording will be made available on our FIG Climate Compass Task Force YouTube channel uh, alongside our other events. Courtesy of Dana Heyman, the seminar will be mind mapped and live scribed and you will see this emerge during the, the sessions today. Finally, the presentation and interactive discussions, are uh, we seeing your boarding pass? <laughs> uh, your in, and interactive discussions recorded during the seminar will be contributed to an FIG publication. Right, let's look at content next. 
This seminar is about how surveyors can use spatial data and technologies, digital transformation and innovation for climate action. Together, we will be defining and assessing what the big global land, carbon and biodiversity issues are that are relevant for surveyors working at national and local levels. This means thinking about what the legal, policy, financial and capacity implications are for rolling out new solutions at the scale necessary. Opportunities will be identified for the development of the future of the surveying profession, including technical opportunities and how surveying education needs to be rethought. Let's have a look at the structure of the seminar. After this uh, introduction and housekeeping, uh, next. After this introduction, housekeeper and I will open with a rapid overview of the UN climate goals on carbon, biodiversity, and land degradation restoration, and how they are linked to surveyors. We will then hear from our three expert practitioners speaking on a diverse range of case studies on climate resilience. Each of them will present for around 20 minutes. Then we will have a panel discussion where questions will be asked for each speaker, one at a time. 10 minutes each, followed up by a summary from the facilitators, five minutes each. We will then have a presentation from Dana of the Live Scribe and from uh, Roshni uh, on the Kinefin framework. Then we will move into our 55 minute interactive session where we hope to hear from our participants who can ask direct questions from the speakers. Um, participants, as I said, please, uh, in, for the panel, just put your questions in the chat. When we come to the live uh, interactive plenary, do raise hands as well as uh, questions in the chat. So uh, we're here to uh, learn from each other and to discuss the, the main issue of our time. Um, we will then uh, finish with another live scribe at the end of the interactive session and a closing uh, by either Roshni or I as we transition into the task force first, uh, first annual meeting of this three seminar series. Noting that the, the task force meeting is open to all and it's also an opportunity for general task force members, many of whom are on this Zoom and committee members to meet each other to hear about our terms of reference and to uh, be uh, present, uh, to hear what our accomplishments are to date and to see where we go from here. Uh, the aim of this seminar, part of the meeting, is to end in three and a half hours at 18.30 p.m. GMT and the annual task force meeting will follow immediately for half an hour and end at 19.00 p.m. GMT. So, now we can tr transition immediately into the next session. Next. And I will present on what do the global climate goals mean for land, water, and marine surveying. Next. So scientists have identified nine planetary boundaries that humanity dare not cross, otherwise we endanger our future. Surveyors are vital to the management of all these planetary boundaries. The three zones here in red that uh, you can see, surveyors can do something about, and that's carbon, biodiversity, and land use change. Noting that 13 to 20%, 21% of global emissions annually are linked to land use change. Next. So the governments and people of the world have set goals which allow us to protect people and the planet regarding carbon, biodiversity, and land use change. We often hear the words COP28 or limit global warming to 1.5 or biodiversity loss or land degradation neutrality. So what does this all mean for surveyors and how do we engage? So I'm going to take you on a very rapid tour to give us the background to these terms and show you why it's important. In 1992, the governments of the world held a conference in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, called the Earth Summit. And at the meeting, the governments decided humanity should address the interconnected challenges facing the planet of climate change, biodiversity, and sorry, biodiversity loss and desertification. 
All three of these are linked to land, water, and marine surveying. To address these challenges, the governments at the Earth Summit founded three sister Rio conventions, which are supported by UN entities overseen by the governments of the world. The government's role is known as the Conference of the Parties, hence the word COPS, and governments are the parties. These conventions and the name of the UN entities supporting them are, firstly, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, also known as UN Climate Change, deals with carbon-related issues and climate change. Obviously, forest and deforestation are example here. The Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD, also known as UN Biodiversity, deals with the protection of biodiversity, such as forests, indigenous plants. Then the third one is the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, UNCCD. It deals with land degradation, drought, and desertification, and the land tenure aspects linked to this land use and advocates for land degradation neutrality. And I'll define that just now. Each of the three conventions holds meetings, what we call COPs, every few years. The number of the COP shows how many COPs have been held by that particular Rio Convention since the original meeting. The most recent well-known one is the Climate Change COP28, which was held in Dubai in 2023. The CBD Convention also holds COPs, it's, with its latest being COP15, held in 2022. It ad adopted a new set of goals for biodiversity called the Kunming Montreal Global Bi Biodiversity Framework, GBF, to which 188 governments committed. Among its goals are con to conserve and manage 30% of the Earth's terrestrial and marine areas by 2030, and to restore 30% of degraded ecosystems by 2030. The UNCCD Convention also holds COPs, and its latest COP15, held in 2022, agreed to accelerate this restoration of 1 billion hectares of degraded land by 2030. Next. It's quite hard to interpret what uh, the COPs mean for surveyors. You've got a good map here on the right. Uh, the purple areas show land degradation, for instance, in Australia. So each COP of each convention produces a range of policies, resolutions, declarations, agreement by partners, many of which impact the work of surveyors. Often the impact and their discussions is unclear because of the climate technical language being used and the global scale of their analysis. So let's talk about four examples. UNCCD COP14, Decision of Parties 26 slash 14, calls for land tenure issues to be addressed and among other things, encourages governments to adopt national land governance legislation to support, to support sustainable land use and land restoration and recognize legitimate land rights, including customary rights. UNFCCC COP28 on Agriculture, Food and Climate National Action Toolkit. This was signed by 130 countries. And so for the first time, we saw food and agriculture given major attention within climate discussions. And governments were urged to integrate it within their national strategies, including NDCs and national and adaptation plans. UNFCC COP26 declaration in 2022 was on the Glasgow Declaration on Forests and Land Use. This declaration was endorsed by 145 countries co covering 90% of forests. These countries are committed to working collectively to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030, while delivering sustainable development and promoting an inclusive rural transformation. This includes forest and other ecosystem conservation, redesigning agriculture, sustainable production and consumption and recognizing indigenous peoples and local communities. Then we have UNCBD COP15 decision 15 slash four, this Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework that I've already mentioned, which sets aside 30% of the earth's surface, terrestrial and marine, for conservation by 2030. 
and 30% of de degraded land to be restored by 2030, noting that 20 to 40% of the world's land is already degraded. So the land and water governance impacts of this are enormous, and surveyors have a vital role in sorting out who gets what where and for what purpose. Next. So let's have a look at some national, oh, sorry, can we go back one, my, my mistake. So what, is, what does this mean in terms of national environmental plans? The world's governments have committed to support these goals and they do this by producing national environmental plans that are part of the UN reporting process on how countries are doing in meeting our climate goals. Most governments have three sets of national plans relating to the environment. Each plan is linked to a different UN convention, a different Rio convention. The three sets of national reports often don't align with each other. And you can find your country's three reports on the web and the links are here. These reports are known as NDC, NBSAP, and the LDN targets. And I'll explain them very quickly here. Let's look at the climate one. Governments have to supply a nationally determined contribution, an NDC report to NF, UNFCCC. This is a climate action plan to cut emissions and adapt to climate impacts. Each government or party to the Paris Agreement is required to develop an NDC and update it every five years. Note, the next point of updating is 2025. As of 2022, 193 governments, parties to the Paris Agreement, with 166 NDC reports. Biodiversity. Governments supply a national biodiversity strategies and action plans, NBSAP report to UNCBD. These national reports outline national strategies, plans or programs for the conservation and sustainable use of biological diversity, and provide strategic direction at national level on the management and protection of biodiversity. There are 196 parties to the convention with 185 NBSAP reports. And then land degradation. Governments supply a land degradation neutrality report, LDN, to UNCCD. LDN is a state whereby the amount and quality of land resources necessary to support ecosystem functions and services and enhance food security remain stable or increase within specified temporal and spatial scales and ecosystems. 129 countries have committed to setting LDN targets and there are 100 LDN reports. You can find your reports for for your country in all these links. Of great interest for this audience is there is a group on Earth observation that supports the UNCCD on the STG monitoring of LDN and, and their reporting. All national governments have been provided by this Earth observation group with default data on land cover, land productivity, and soil organic carbon derived from global data sources. Next. So what does this mean for surveyors? Surveyors are vital to the achievement of all these Rio, Rio conventions and the future of the planet and people. In these seminars, we are asking ourselves, what are the key roles that surveyors are already playing regarding measuring, managing, and mitigating the present and future impacts of climate change? What specific knowledge and capacity do surveyors have to help achieve the global goals of the Rio Conventions, and what capacity development is still needed for surveyors working on the climate crisis. Next. Surveyors have a major role in monitoring and measuring. They implement survey, they need to implement the surveying aspects of national climate plans. They need to manage land use change, which is causing carbon and biodiversity loss such as limiting agricultural expansion into urban and natural areas. They need to strengthen land systems for tenure security and spatial planning and land use controls and improve geospatial data and mapping. As we're talking about collection, analysis, management, monitoring and measuring. And of course, strengthen valuation systems and bring in natural accounting to do risk management, carbon offsets, compensation and property markets. 
surveyors are absolutely critical in the monitoring and measurement of sea level rise and coastal zone management, and finally, critical to natural disaster and building back better. So these are all the things that we have come to learn about in the seminars. Next. So now I'm going to uh, present uh, our three speakers. Um, Ms. Sue Donoza is the expert lead and responsible for the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service, CLMS, within Europe for the European Environment Agency. She has two master's degrees, one on geoinformation science and one on law and political science. She will speak on Copernicus Land Monitoring Service, its free data sets and dashboards used by the world on climate, land, water and marine. Then we will have Mr. Simon Msvengia. He's a land tenure specialist at the United Nations UN Habitat, supporting Ugandan land country operations. He is a valuer with a land management master's. He will talk on customary tenure and local forms of land certificates within the National Land Administration System, linked to natural resource certificates for access to wetlands. Mr. Nelson Nieto is an environmental engineer specialized, specializing in GIS and climate change. He is a researcher in the field of Earth Observation Technologies of the Research and Prospective Directorate of the Geographic Institute, Augustin Codesi of Colombia. He will present on a study of the mangrove forest with Earth Observation hypersectoral field data and satellite images for a better understanding of this strategic ecosystem and its relationship with ethnic communities of the Colombian Pacific region. Thank you. And we will start immediately with you, Asur. You have 20 minutes plus video. Thank you very much, Harrison, for the introduction. I will share my screen now. Please let me know if you're um, doing it correctly, just in case. Uh, it's in present view at the moment. Yeah. Now it should be okay. This is perfect. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much. So as Clarissa said, I am, uh, my name is Ushuela Nezarroyos. I work for the European Environment Agency in Copenhagen. Um, and I am the project lead for Copernicus at the European Environment Agency. Well, this is first an index on, on what I am going to present. I will give a short introduction to what Copernicus is. Then I will focus on the service I am uh, managing. I will give uh, an, uh, an overview of the access to data, uh, some present some use cases, and then uh, give an overview of the planned evolution of the service. Well, first, what is Copernicus? Uh, I, maybe you already know all this, but I, I, it's always good to go back uh, and, and think about it sometimes or review, uh, remind it. The Copernicus is the Earth Observation component of the European Union's space program. It's looking at our planet and its environment, and it's meant to benefit all European citizens, but also since its, uh, its uh, scale is global, it is also meant to um, benefit all uh, citizens in the world. It offers information services, not only that come uh, from satellite to uh, derive information from these satellites. It is implemented by member states, the European Space Agency, uh, the European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites, uh, European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, EU agencies, such as the one I am working for, the European Environment Agency, the Joint Research Center, and Mercator Ocean International. And this is, um, this is a schema of what Copernicus actually is, because I think uh, I, I made up this, this slide some time ago, and I'm still using it every now and then, uh, because I think it's very, um, it shows in a very intuitive way what we are doing. So we have uh, it, we have on the Earth, we have the in situ component, which is also managed by the European Environment Agency, and it's giving access to in situ data to other Copernicus services. And this is only for the European part. And then we have the satellites above in the space, which are uh, 
looking at us from space with the sentinels, and this is managed by the European Space Agency. And then we have what we call the monitoring component, which are the six, the currently the six services that are uh, that are available and that are working. We have the three uh, services that we call the environmental services, atmosphere, land, and marine. And then we have um, the other ones, we have the emergency management service, we have the security as well, and we have the climate change. And the difference between them is that climate change, emergency, and security are actually users of the data created by the atmosphere, land, and marine. The Copernicus Land Monitoring Service is managed by two different entrusted entities. It's managed by the European Environment Agency for all the data created within Europe and by the Joint Research Center for the data created at global level. You can uh, learn more about this in the, in the web, which is www.copernicus.eu. So within the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service, what we do is we create geographical information on land cover and its changes, on land use, on the vegetation status, water cycle, and the Earth's surface energy variables on European, both on European and global level. The data we are producing is harmonized and consistent in time and space. This is one of the biggest added values of our products is that it is the same information for the whole area. So the differences between countries disappear. All the products and manuals are free and open. I will come to this afterwards. And as I said before, it's implemented between the Joint Research Center and the European Environment Agency. We are basically working in these six uh, areas of work that you can see on the left part of the slide. Land cover and land use mapping, priority area monitoring, biogeophysical parameters, ground motion monitoring, reference and validation data, and satellite data. And I will, come back, I will now present, give a very short introduction on what this means. Once you enter the Copernicus uh, Land Monitoring Service portal, you will show you will see these six areas of uh, of work. You will see the land cover and land use mapping, both for global and Europe. The priority area monitoring. This is a priority area monitoring. While the, while the land cover and land use mapping and um, satellite data are created for the whole territory for the whole area of interest. Priority area monitoring is focusing on specific areas of the terrain. I will give some examples afterwards. We are also producing uh, mosaics, global, uh, global and European mosaics of satellite data, so people can access it uh, through web map services. We are producing what we call biogeophysical parameters that are depicting the status of vegetation and the evolution of vegetation and the water, both in its uh, solid and its in, uh, liquid state within the, the, the terrestrial water. We are also monitoring the ground motion. So how does the, 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 the ground move due to different, uh, um, due to different causes that could be uh, human intervention, but could also be natural causes. And then we are also create, we are also in charge of giving access to reference and validation data. At global level, this means that we have, if we go from left to right, first we have the global systematic monitoring. This means for the whole health, you have data on uh, related to the status of vegetation, the status of water and also land cover and land cover change. All these data are created in, a, in what we call in remote sensing, low spatial resolution, which means about 300 meters per pixel, except for the global land cover that now has moved to 10 meters pixel. We also have uh, ground-based observations for validation that could, can be used in the validation of satellite imagery. And we have the hotspot monitoring. The global component has two different types of hotspot uh, or, or priority area monitoring. 
We have those that are uh, monitored. This is, we create land cover and land use data uh, due to its interest on biodiversity. And we also have the ones that are due to its interest on agriculture. Most of them are located in Africa and in South America. And as I said, we are also responsible for creating global uh, sentiment to mosaics. So these are mosaics of images that cover the whole uh, globe and that are created at 10 meters spatial resolution. While at the European Environment Agency, we have a, a similar but slightly different uh, portfolio. I will not go into details because it's a very wide portfolio and then we would probably run out of time. But in short, you will have what you see here on the upper part is what we call the priority area monitoring. In this case, in Europe, for Europe, we are monitoring urban areas with more than 50,000 um, inhabitants. We are also monitoring riparian and coastal zones due to their uh, importance for biodiversity. And we are also uh, monitoring um, protected areas that are covering the natural 2000 areas. On the, on the part in the middle, you see the pan-European products. These are land cover and land use products that cover the whole EA38, the European Economic Area. We have the Corinne Land Cover, which is one of our most famous products. Uh, since it is, it has been ongoing, it has been, first time it was created was in 1990. And then since 2000, year 2000 has been updated every six years. And we also have the high resolution layers that are, uh, that are giving land cover characteristics such as tree cover density. And down in the slide, you can see first the EU Hydro, which is a, a hydrological network net that we are mapping. We have the European Ground Motion Service. This is the uh, it, this is only available at, at European level. We currently do not have a global level uh, a service as such. It would uh, entail uh, it is it, ha it has a huge volume data volume and doing it at global level, though it is possible, it wouldn't tell a huge effort, but we will see because there are some countries that are really interested in doing it. And then we have the biophysical par parameters that, as I said, they are mapping uh, vegetation status and phenology and the water cycle. All our data sets are quality assessed, they are fully documented, they are freely available, and what is more, we have a long-term commitment to produce them. This is very important because uh, when you consult one of our products, you know that it's going, it has a time series behind that goes in some cases until 2006. But not only that, there is a commitment to, in, to produce these products on the long term. This is why we only produce things uh, products that are on their operational phase. This is that they can be produced reliably and consistently on a time series. Uh, so to make sure that every time one of our products is uptaken, you can trust that it will be maintained even if we could introduce some changes. This is very important and especially at European level since our products are being used to monitor European policies. Our data are available through the portal. They are also available through Wikio. Wikio is a cloud. Uh, and then the access in, through Wikio is a bit different. I put I included all the links so people can check. In the future, it will also be uh, they will also be available through the Copernicus data space ecosystem. But this is unfortunately not available now. This is something that the European Commission is building up now. I can suggest you all, we have uh, a lot of demo sessions and a lot of trainings and a lot of webinars, and all of them are stored in our YouTube channel. I will suggest if you can, I invite you all to check them, to check our portal, to see what is available there. Then we also, we have manuals and we have documentation for all of our products. But what is more interesting is that you can also find demos uh, and trainings that you can attend freely.
on what is the plan evolution of the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service. And uh, I will not go into detail on this, but we have some, we, we have different uh, evolution drivers of the service. First, we have the input data. We are dependent on the satellite data. This was, this in the past made us dependent on other, uh, other uh, space agencies, as it was the case with NASA. Now with the European Space Agency and with the Sentinels, we have um, we have a long-term commitment to have this data available. This has allowed us to produce products that are were not that easily produced in the past, such as produ products based on SAR or products based on uh, what we call um, full exploitation of time series. This meaning that the, you you use all images that are available for a given period. And in case of the sentinels, this is one image per every five days. Another driver of our evolution is the level of automation. We are now going, moving towards higher uh, automation of our products. We are also evolving on the types of our products. We are uh, committed to, uh, document, to documenting everything to a high level of transparency and reproducibility of our product. We are now uh, moving our classification approaches. And of course, we need, we are all the time under the umbrella of the European Commission environment. And of course, some of the de decisions taken by the European Commission impact us. And now I will talk about two specific use cases uh, where we see how were our products used? One is when they, uh, the use of our products for urban planning in Guatemala. They were uh, they used information related to vegetation to uh, better plan, uh, better urban planning, preserve rainforests and water sources, also per, per, uh, um, preserve uh, the 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 biodiversity, ensure forest connectivity between areas and uh, prevent, uh, pre prevention of wildfires and landslides. What they did is they integrated the vegetation change data that we provide with soil topography to guide the field engineers. Another good example of use case is this by the UNESCO where they used uh, the land cover provided by the global component of the land monitoring service to monitor the impact of a, a hydropower project. You can find all of all our use cases in our web. Uh, I included the link. We have a, we are now in the process of um, of gathering more use cases. Uh, we are trying to encourage people to submit them. There are several of them. You can see uh, the ones that I included in the slide, such as um, how there, there is a, a very nice use case that was published this week on how they are uh, how they are studying the, the, on a study on uh, how the urban heat islands affect vegetation in urban areas. We are also, um, how do we map the coast of Europe or um, how should we manage better the urban green spaces, which are, which are is key in the new, in the European Green Deal. Um, we are also monitoring the, the, the extent of soil sealing, for instance. Um, I invite you all to uh, follow us on LinkedIn for more information and news on, on new on, on trainings that we will be delivering soon. And with this, I finish a little bit early, uh, earlier than expected. So I will now stop sharing my screen. And I give the floor to Rosnik, who will put the video to help my group. Thank you very much. Are you able to hear the sound? No, not yet. We can see, but we can't hear.
Yes, fine. Our planet is full of wonders. A tapestry of landscapes, each with its own unique heritage. These landscapes are, however, changing. Data derived from satellite observations allow us to understand more. From river deltas to mountain ranges, we can monitor crucial ecosystems. From coastal zones to forested areas, we can better manage our natural resources. The journey to a sustainable future also runs through urban environments where we make informed decisions that will shape our shared future for generations to come. Copernicus Land Monitoring Service. Thank you very much. Um for that uh, very rich presentation and uh, the fact that it's a free service is just incredible. Thank you for that. So now uh, we are going to uh, turn to listen to Simon Peter on Uganda. So Simon Peter, you have 20 minutes plus video. Thank you. Are you with us, Simon Peter? This is Clarissa. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. Allow me within a few minutes. Um, you're breaking Let up, Simon. Let me know Peter. when you can see my phone. Um, yes. Can you hear me now better? I can hear you better now. Thank you. And can you, you see my power? Yep, just go to full, full screen. Thank you very much, and thank you for the introduction. No, not at not, not full uh, screen. Uh, Simon, if um, you could please um, change your presentation to full screen mode, we're currently seeing the Simon Peter Moisije. Can you see the full screen now? Perfect, thank you. Okay, great. So um, as introduced, I'm Simon Peter Amwesije. I work with the United Nations Human Settlements Program and the Global Land Tool Network here in Uganda. And I wanted this uh, afternoon to share with you uh, some perspectives from a community on regarding a community-based approach for sustainable wetland management. Uh, using a case study of Butaleja here in Uganda. So um, for my presentation, I will share uh, some insights on the context of land governance in Uganda. I will also um, share some perspectives of what GLTN and Land at Scale Project is doing to address uh, some of the challenges that I will highlight. And then I will also share some perspectives about the Global Land Tool Network. Um, and then I will also uh, present um, the climate uh, resilient uh, land governance and what it means um, in, 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 in the case that I'm going to present for the wetland management. And then I will present the Butaleja case which is uh, showcasing uh, wise use of wetland using a community-based approach. And then I will conclude. So um, to start off um, my presentation, allow me share some uh, perspectives on some of the key, what we consider as the key land governance challenges in Uganda. Uh, so Uganda has uh, a complex land tenure system 
um, characterized by uh, four uh, recognized tenure systems and um, and and majority of Ugandans, uh, eighty percent of them access land through customary land tenure systems, which are largely unregistered. Um, the the rights um, under customary land tenure system not only vary from one region to another, uh, but they are also complex. Um, uh, they are complex in nature, and um, uh, also the claims and um, the records are not easy to um, uh, to record and formalize. Uh, we also have limited cadastral uh, coverage, uh, so less than 20% of Uganda is covered by uh, land registration and uh, land information, uh, formal land information system. So um, the other issue that is really critical um, here uh, when we talk about land governance uh, is with uh, the, the gender equitable uh, land, governance, land governance concerns. Um, although women contribute uh, over 70% to the agriculture workforce, uh, only 3% of uh, land is registered in the names of women and girls. And this is mainly uh, because of the uh, culture uh, and social uh, norms and practices that uh, marginalize women and girls when it comes to uh, land rights. The, the, the other um, issue here is really the uh, rapid urbanization, which is putting pressure uh, on land and natural resources. So Uganda is still largely rural, uh, over 75% of uh, the land area is covered by rural areas, but it is also one of the fastest urbanizing uh, countries in Africa. And so there is um, a slum prolification in um, the major city, but also in uh, the regional or secondary cities in Uganda. And, and so this is exacerbating uh, pressure uh, on land and natural resources such as wetlands. There are also a high number of land uh, evictions and disputes. Um, not a day goes by uh, without um, a high profile case of uh, land grabbing, um, sometimes involving influential and powerful um, uh, people. Uh, and sometimes some of these cases of land grabbing affect thousands and thousands of people. Um, so this is also um, exerting a lot of uh, pressure uh, on the customary land tenure systems. Um, in addition and relatedly, we have also weak land institutions. Uh, although Uganda has made significant progress uh, in terms of uh, the policy and the regulatory uh, framework and uh, reforms, uh, there has been slow implementation. And this is uh, mainly because of the weak land administration and land management institutions. In, in terms of the wetlands, um, um, most mo uh, wetlands are really very important. Uh, they cover a significant area in Uganda. Um, uh, they also are underpin rural livelihoods, uh, especially agriculture. Um, however, um, what we see in the last few decades is that the rate of degradation is really very high. And, and so it is estimated that if this continues in the next few years, Uganda will have no wetlands. Now, um, in this context, uh, GLTN and Land at Scale project um, is looking at contributing to development of uh, a, structure, a structured and scalable approach towards improving uh, tenure security and sustainable land use for men, women, youth on customary land in a participatory way. So the project has three major key areas of intervention. One it is looking at um, improving land tenure security for men, women, and youth. Um, yeah, mainly it's uh, looking at the customary land 
and your system, which I say, as I said before, um, uh, land. And then uh, the second key intervention is inclusive, climate smart, and sustainable uh, land use planning. And then the third one is improved uh, capacity and awareness of key land stakeholders on customer land uh, registration and land use planning. This specific project uh, covers four regions uh, in Uganda. Uh, that is the Choga Plains, which is in the east of Uganda, uh, together with Elgon region, and then the Chigezi region, which is in the southwest of the country, and the West Nile, which is in the northwest. Um, the basic premise of this uh, intervention um, is um, the application um, and customization of poor gender responsive and fit for purpose uh, land tools and adapt and customized uh, to different contexts and then used um, to implement existing policy and legal. framework. Um, Simon Peter, you're breaking up. So the GLTN with over 85 partners who are several land tools. Um, which, sorry, can you hear me now better? Um, yes, keep going. Now we can hear you. Yes, uh, Simon Peter, just so you know, I've turned your video off to help the quality of the audio and the, I hope that helps. Thanks, I hope it helps too. Can you hear me now? Perfectly. Great. So um, GLTN was formed in 2006 um, um, uh, to, to develop, uh, and it brings uh, together over 85 partners, um, mainly uh, working uh, to develop and influence uh, global uh, normative work uh, uh, around land governance. Uh, they are developing proper and gender sensitive um, and fit for purpose uh, land tools, which uh, can be applied in different uh, member state countries um, like Uganda um, uh, to implement existing uh, land policies and land laws. And GLTN was formed out of recognition that the land governance challenges are known um, but there is limited uh, understanding and uh, tools on how uh, different land policies and land governance challenges can be uh, dealt with. Uh, so the, the network has developed um, a, a toolbox, um, has developed several tools, um, ranging from tools for land administration, tools for um, ma managing land information, um, uh, tools for land use planning um, uh, and several other areas, including gender mainstreaming, um, uh, you know, engaging young people in land governance and, and others. And, and, and so these tools are available. Um, and, and what the, the network does, um, and this is also the case in Uganda, it develops capacity of uh, national governments and local governments, as well as other non-state actors, uh, to be able to use these tools uh, to implement um, uh, land policies and uh, land laws, uh, as well as deal with uh, the different land governance challenges. Um, I wanted also to share with you some perspectives on um, customer land tenure. Um, and as I say, this is important because that's the context in which we work in. Um, as as you you know, it has been argued that customer land tenure in Africa is uh, the main recipe for underdevelopment, and it is a major cause of the region's untold levels of rural poverty. But um, we we also know that efforts to individualize um, the tenure system um, in the past have failed. Uh, they have done more harm than good. And, and, and so there is um, increased um, recognition that um, the institutional frameworks um, um, within the customary land tenure um, are resilient 
and um, if supported, um, they can be a strong basis um, for social, cultural, and geospatial uh, identity. Um, also, um, the emerging social and economic uh, pressures on land, the, the flexible negotiation rules, the characteristics of customary tenure systems, um, uh, uh, nowadays, uh, especially in the context that I described before, where there is all this pressure, uh, can easily be manipulated by individuals who are seeking power and control over land. And, and therefore, um, it is important that we look at um, uh, with, with the understanding also uh, that it varies, as I mentioned, in the case of Uganda, for instance, uh, it varies from one region to another. Um, and, and so with that understanding, it is important uh, that um, we, we, you know, we, we, we try to support uh, the tenure systems um, um, and deal with uh, the different challenges there are in, but also um, the, the system should be allowed to evolve and 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 accommodate uh, social culture and um, the, the 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 economic conditions, um, um, the current economic conditions. So, in terms of um, the nexus um, between uh, land governance and climate resilience, which we are working in, in in the case that I'm going to present uh, for the wetland, this uh, graphic uh, really reflects our conceptual framework. Um, the understanding that uh, land tenure system or secure land rights are very critical for um, climate uh, change adaptation and so I'm in Peter are you there? for um, for for um, as well as um, effective tool for. Uh, ensuring disaster risk reduction. Hello, have you lost me again? Can you hear me? We lost you momentarily, but you're back loud and clear. Oh, thank you. I'm glad I'm back. So I don't know how much you lost, but I was just um, really explaining that uh, this graphic that you see is our um, conceptual framework for the interventions that we are implementing in Butaleja and other parts of Uganda, the four regions that I talked about before. Um, and and I, was, um, I was highlighting the importance of uh, land use planning um, as an effective tool for ensuring uh, disaster risk uh, reduction. So um, allow me now uh, um, describe in, in more detail the case of Butaleja. Uh, Butaleja is um, a district in the Choga Plains. Uh, it's located in the eastern part of the country. Um, Butaleja is covered 40% um, uh, by wetlands. Uh, so what this means is that really communities um, uh, rely on the wetlands for their uh, survival. Um, as you can see, it's a significant um, coverage of the district and so are other districts in the region, such as Zimbali and others. Um, and, and then about uh, seven, more than 70% of Butaleja, um, uh, smaller holder farmers rely on the wetlands for agriculture. Um, they are mainly engaged in growing uh, uh, lowland rice, um, uh, and 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 other food crops. So um, uh, wetlands in Butaleja have been facing degradation, uh, mainly due to their conversion um, into rice production, and and this is leading to long-term environmental impacts. So the main uh, project objective is to promote sustainable climate, uh, smart, inclusive use of the wetland resources, uh, using the community-led approach. Um, um, and, and, and also using the Propua land tools, uh, such as the social tenure domain model, um, tenure responsive land use planning and others, as well as applying the alternative dispute resolution to be able to deal and, uh, with the land conflicts in the districts. 
Um, and, and so the interaction uh, between the community and 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 the wetland um, the wetland uh, raises a, a lot of challenges, um, mainly uh, resulting into land disputes uh, between different communities, different individuals, but also community and the authorities um, who are also trying to uh, prevent the degradation. And and so um, what we see there. Uh, really is um, the encroachment and um, illegal wetland use. Uh, we see uh, poor agricultural uh, use practices, um, as well as um, disputes are very high. Um, mainly the, the, the farmers also access uh, the wetlands through informal land rental arrangements. And, and there are also many boundary disputes. Now, um, also, also um, what you see and when you talk to people, what they tell you is that um, they, they already uh, feel the impacts of climate change. And, um, and, 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 and as you know, um, Africa in general um, and Uganda uh, contribute less in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, emissions, but um, the, the, the impact of climate change change um we are uh, so what we see more in butaleja is that there are extreme conditions um, um characterized by flooding when it rains uh, but also long droughts uh, so the weather conditions are changing uh, you also see destructions of biodiversity and then the wetland exploitation and degradation and and the impact of this is really um evictions so um some of the communities are being evicted from their land and from uh, the use of the wetland, um, but also um, uh, there is um, uh, low agricultural productivity, despite them, uh, some of them expanding their farms uh, to encroach on larger parts of the wetland, as well as uh, the loss and unsustainable uh, livelihoods and food insecurity. So this uh, loop casa diagram, uh, shows the relationship uh, between um, uh, different um, land tenure, land governance, uh, and environmental variables. Um, and, and, and really what I wanted to say here is that um, it, it's really a complex um, relationship as reflected here. Um, so, so what you can see, you know, different land governance, land tenure, um, um, you know, uh, situations and how they impact, um, how they impact on on the on the biodiversity and and the ecosystem uh, in the wetland, and 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 some of the actions that are being uh, taken or the interventions and how uh, those help to improve um, uh, both land tenure situation um, and 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 the. Um, and, and, and the biodiversity and, and conservation of the wetland. And, and so uh, really um, there is a very clear connection between uh, land tenure, uh, land governance and, and um, um, a natural resource conservation uh, or uh, wise use of natural resources. So this um, shows the process which we are supporting the communities um, to go through in order to be able to um, uh, to develop uh, wetland re wetland use resource um, um, to acquire wetland resource use permits, uh, but also to develop uh, wetland uh, wetland um, management plans, as well as um, uh, we support the communities to be able to. Um, to incorporate themselves into uh, communal wetland associations, which are really a community structure, but um, it plays a, a key role, um, um, uh, to, you know, to link the the community to uh, the local authorities, um, as well as um, uh, to organize the community and for them to receive the formal recognition from uh, the uh, the local government uh, and the authorities. 
Now, um, uh, Simon briefly, Peter? also let Simon, me. Simon Peter. Simon Peter. Yes, please. Yes, Clarissa. Um, we kind of the time is running. Do you think you could summarize? Yes, I will do that in the next two minutes, if that's okay. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Okay, so um, one of the things we see from this experience is that um, uh, recognizing uh, wetland user uh, rights through mapping is key to successful community-based wetland management. So when communities have clear user rights, that results into sustainable use and natural protection of resources. The second um, uh, point here, or um, what we uh, see as uh, from this case of Butaleja is the participation of the wetland um, users in the wetland management planning processes. Uh, it ensures that uh, people are directly impacted by wetland changes. They have a say in how uh, they are managed and decisions are more relevant, accepted, and implemented. Um, and therefore, this uh, improves re resilience against uh, climate impacts. And then um, I also wanted to highlight that uh, community-based wetland uh, uh, governance structures, such as the wetland management committees, facilitate knowledge dissemination between the sustainable wetland uh, management and climate resilience. Uh, uh, and lastly, the uh, project's land governance interventions, uh, the mapping of wetland user rights, the alternative dispute resolution, the, the wetland management planning ensures wetlands, uh, ensures that wetlands are used sustainably, contributing to longer term uh, climate resilience. And, and really the game changer here is the PROPUA and the fit for purpose uh, land tools and the capacity building um, that we are doing for both the communities, for the local government, uh, and also for the, um, for, for the civil society organizations that are supporting the communities. So, so um, um, that are continuing despite um, these efforts, um, one of them is really that uh, local governance, which is really critical for scaling up these interventions. They have limited uh, capacity and uh, resources. So the natural resource um, and environment departments uh, in the districts, they have limited um, uh, staff, they have limited tools and funding uh, to carry out work in the community. And yet we see this really as important uh, for sustainability of the interventions. The second thing is really that um, there is um, some political interference. Uh, for instance, the president has recently issued an order to limit the issuance of the wetland uh, use resource permits. There are efforts to engage um, the, the, the president um, to, um, you know, uh, uh, um, to, to lift uh, this, um, this order. Um, but this is still uh, ongoing and somehow also it is affecting these um, activities. And the last one is that um, the changing um, discriminatory cultural belief um, um, uh, that, you know, and getting the benefits, um, it takes time uh, and requires also patient funding which um, in our experience is really rare to come by. Uh, most of the funding is limited by time. And within the time of projects, it's always very difficult uh, to be able to cause the change, the social and, um, uh, and cultural uh, engineering that is needed to be able to influence uh, uh, the, cult the culture and social norms that have, uh, prevent women from enjoying um, their full rights. Um, as I conclude, um, uh, let me take one minute to conclude, Clarissa, if I may. Um, yes, no, please just wind up now. Thank you. Thank you. So um, this case of Butaleja that I just presented um, involving um, the community in planning, um, uh, management and conserving the wetlands, um, the, the primary goal is really to ensure that uh, wetland resources are managed uh, sustainably. 
and 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 what we aim really to achieve is the balance between economic development, social equity, and environmental protection. Um, also, collaborative interdisciplinary approaches that involve local communities, uh, government agencies, NGOs, professionals such as surveyors and planners, and other stakeholders um, is really important um, in, in, in the success of this intervention and for sustainable wetland management. Um, lastly, um, this experience demonstrates that adopting innovative, procure, uh, gender-sensitive and scalable land tools and approaches promotes land and natural resource management systems that prioritize the needs of the people and their relationship to land. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you, uh, Clarissa, for the additional time. Thank over you, Simon, Peter. Appreciate you very much. Simon, Peter, we, we've kind of run over time, so we, we, let's just keep your video and see if we have time in the uh, plenary session. Um, and I really now want to move straight on to uh, Nelson Nieto. Uh, he, he, you have 21 minutes, Nelson. Okay, um, are you showing uh, my screen? Yes, uh, we can see the presenter view at the moment, Nelson. Okay, thank Perfect. you. Well, uh, first, of all, first of all, uh, I would like to thank in the name of the Geographic Institute Agustin Classi for this opportunity. It's very important to us in the research and directorate to be able to communicate our, our findings or results or methodologies. Um, well, in timeline of talk, I like to start by mentioning that and uh, this uh, this presentation would be focused on the the research we have been conducting the past um, five years almost. In the general outline here, we have in the Pacific region of Colombia. It's a very, very general outline. It's mainly characterized by mangrove forests and indigenous populations. It's also been is characterized by a history of violence and very being a some um, natural regional zone in Colombia that is very difficult to traverse, to travel, to get around, to study and to map. And additionally, in is um, a climatically and uh, environmentally speaking is very difficult zone in our country to be able to study. Uh, three months all year round is completely covered by clouds, so it, it very it restricts uh, heavily on the available satellite images that we can use. And being the Geographic Institute in, in charge of the national cartography is always been a big challenge to keep this area of the country up to date in cartography, in cartography and casting information. So in, in collaboration with the in scientific expedition of the in Ocean Commission of Colombia, from since 2021, we have been uh, participating in different uh, expeditions to study the mangrove forest. And it has started from field as a, spectroviometry, acquiring field data from different types of spectroviometers and high spectral field data in order to uh, characterize different spectral aspects of uh, mainly the vegetation, but in the most recent uh, expedition has been focused also in man-made structures. So uh, why, is, why is this region so important? First of all, is the mango forest. We know is one of the main ecosystem or main uh, subjects in, in the talk of climate change, about blue carbon, uh, about in the adaptability to climate change, how resilient the communities uh, that inhabit them, and how important it is for the, the life cycle of many species that makes not just the dietary requirements of, of this community, but also the housing um, in general to livelihood. So it's a critical, uh, a very strategic ecosystem that um, encompasses, in, in my view, very well the 
key challenges we face in, towards climate change. So um, I'd like to focus two main um, issues of this general region in the climate change talking as food security, as I mentioned, and housing. And as, as in most of these um, coastal ecosystems, in most of the housing in, in depends on steel houses that are constructed from the very same um, materials, in, well, wood, wood from the mangrove forest. And, but for the past uh, couple of years, um, we have been noticing an increase in uh, other types of material construction. And we, in the slide, we have uh, a picture of concrete and uh, different types of brick and that are replacing in some senses the, the construction materials in the Pacific region. And we know that in, in this type of ecosystem that is completely clouded and heavily you know, rain throughout the year, and high humidity, and these materials are not ideal. The best you know, response, the best adaptability are those made from the very same wood of the mar forest. But in the over expectation of the specific in, mangrove species that are used for in, this construction, have, uh, have led to an increase in, in this type of in, in this change of construction. So it's, um, it's, it's an issue, a very important issue to take into account in the challenges that faces the different areas we, we are covered. And of course, for security, um, there is a, um, a very high codependence of the communities that inhabit the mangrove forest in the very same in the wildlife. Uh, constitute the requirement needs and uh, their nutritional needs. So uh, in that regard, I wanted to, um, to share this, uh, this example of a, a very interesting program or an instrument that is used in basically in the Department of Chocó, Golf of Chibuga. It's called a uh, pianguimeter, uh, pianguimeter, and, is the this hard shell uh, mollus, uh, Anaura tuberculosa, is one of the main um, food sources in the Pacific, not just in Colombia, but across the Pacific coast in Central and um, South America. So this is a, this is a very simple uh, instrument, but it's very effective and it uh, has made a very big difference in how the community are managing these food resources. In this case, is uh, as I say, it's very simple. Uh, they compare the the models, they find the pianga, and compare it uh, with this red region and the red of the of the ruler. So, if it's in the red, the, they have you know, they recommend to put it back and you not know, harvest the, the pianga, the anara, anara. But uh, if there is in the red zone, green, the green zone, sorry, uh, they can keep it, they can collect it or harvest. So what is uh, the point of this? That um, if they harvest the, this pianga, when it's not in the reproduction life cycle appropriate to, to procreate, uh, they are damaging the food resource. They are uh, affecting the one of the main uh, sources of, uh, of of food they have. So uh, this uh, this little simple device or instrument has made a very big impact in how they uh, the community community understand the, the challenges they are facing in this you know, in this climate change impacts in their ecosystem but also they are empowered themselves on how to you know, correspond appropriately so in this, in this regard you know, we we have uh, let's say try to a new focus on how we can study the mangrove forest from the air observation technologies in this case as I mentioned we feel spectrogram Basically, we go to these regions, to these areas, and in most cases, in national protected you know, zones of the country, with different devices, and mainly spectral radiometries, um, uh, well, all, all, all types of accessories, in order to capture high speed spectral data. These high speed spectral data, um, we know, um, I'm going to advance a little. Uh, we know they um, relay an information of how the um, electromagnetic spectrum uh, interacts with this, the, the observed object, right? 
So as for vegetation, most people that might be attending know or are familiar with the spectral scene, the typical spectral scene include on vegetation. But different regions give, give us different information. So different ways in terms of how the, the the vegetation behaves, how well are they doing, how how old, how young are they growing, are they having any deficiency on in water absorption, in nutrients, etc. And certain types of disease. Also, this information is usually um, not just analyzed, but correlated to the variables, whether the physical variables, variables or more uh, biological data, specific data to this type of uh, certain vegetation species. So um, this uh, relation information is what is mainly the focus of air observation technologies in using satellite imagery, uh, perhaps most most or many of the attendants are work with or have knowledge of the NDVI, the normal distribution index, and how it is for almost let's say 50 to 40 years has been one of the basis of how well or how much we have studied land cover, land vegetation, whether for natural resources of agriculture, and how to behave, how to um, how to how to we monitor this vegetation, how we can predict or estimate the behavior, and whether it be yield, whether it be health, ecosystem health. It is a wider range of what we, we do this type of data. So, um, thanks to the expeditions, the scientific expedition program, we aim to construct a, a bank of a field signatures so we can extend or expand of this type of knowledge. To characterize in the spectral in, in spectrally in the mangrove forest at a species level in order to contribute the into the state knowledge of these ecosystems. So um and just to um, finish this point, um, we know maybe that um, mostly of, of this interaction of the behavior of the vegetation are stored in the near infrared region and the relation with the red in region of the spectrum. So this is, in, in, let's say, um, a basic standard of work with, with, the, with this type of information. Most other programs or, in, or different platforms for observation include at least in images that capture or sensors that can show tears between the visible and the near infrared. This is in, pretty much the basis for, for this type of studies. So, in, in this research, we will, we go to these in uh, these areas in the mangrove forest. We make our field campaign. We collect different spectra with the local local communities, representatives, and leaders. And uh, one of the earliest challenges is that uh, there is very little information of reference to locate the, the different species. We know, of course, the natural distribution of certain species of mangroves, red mangroves, tropical mangroves, mangroves etc. But there is not uh, a reference in shape file to, to say, in, or coverage that to say you have the certain probability that this area, this specific area, is made by a certain species. So we need to go to the field and pretty much find it with the help of the local community. From that, uh, we characterize, uh, say, capture different signatures represented in this diagram. We made different, have made different types of analysis to make certain that the final signature, spectral signature that we have collected is in fact representative of the species of, of interest. And it's, hasn't been, it's not uh, limited to mangroves, we also study on other types of covers. Uh, but uh, of course, the focus, the idea is mainly mangroves. So, from this type of data, the general data we capture for this uh, study area. We aim to generate the end members, that is, that final signature that represents um, individually this object or target that we are interested on. In this case, um, what we are interested in is that is every single one of the, the samples is as most differentiated from each other, because this is what we, it will help us better to identify and individualize every single mangrove species. So this, uh, this is pretty much the summary of this, this um, 
expeditions, the past three expeditions from Santiago National Natural Park, Malago Bay, and Gulf of Cuba. We can see the general behavior or form of the spatial signature for vegetation, the, the reflection peaks in the green region and the infrared, and the uh, noise in the signature. This is an issue when working with freestyle data in field because in high humidity, the constant cloud, uh, cloud cover and the uh, well, general uh, wetness in the environment in, in have uh, a very negative influence in the noise that is generated or captured in this image. And so it's a very big challenge to, to make a proper collection of spectral data. Now, the next step in uh, going beyond just the characterization of this um, species is how we can analyze, correlate this type of data with different images from air observation programs. And as for the moment, the best, in best image we count is the planet scope images up to two meters of spatial resolution. It might be not much, but it's um, for the region is the best we currently have. So, uh, from the metadata, we characterize the technical re requirements in order to convert or resample this field data to the multispectral data, the image uh, that we have. So, we, uh, that results in having a spectral signature of, of over uh, 400 uh, bands, different bands, spectral bands, to about just four uh, bands. Spectral bands, the well, of course the visible and the infrared range. So of course the first thing is that we're going to use a lot of information, and the second thing is that um, we're going to rely even more on the on the typical regions that characterizes better the 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 vegetation, that is red and red, green and near infrared. So even so, even with that all uh, loss of spectral information, there are some um, key differences in every one of the, of the signature. That might be not, uh, let's say, sufficient at this level, but um, from an analysis perspective, it can be promising. So beyond that, we have the sample spectral signature. We want to analyze the image. Um, we've been you know, working mainly in this spectral language map is uh, the most used algorithm for this type of um, exercise. And uh, it relies on the comparison of two um, magnitude measurements of reflectance. So from that, um, we compare the spectral signature from the, of course, the one we captured and the one we get from the image. And he, if the angle is, is, is closer or is wider, and it has um, a more um, close relationship or a more definition, spectrally speaking. So this is one of the earliest examples from this classifying classification exercise. And of course, we could be a little bit skeptic about um, classification species data, vegetation species data from satellite images. For, uh, for, with an image of three, of a special resolution of two meters with only four spectral bands in, in relation to field hyperspectral data. Um, it's very, in, in, well, in general, it could be very debated uh, how can we in, classify it in, information in satellite images at the species level to any type of data, especially since we have the linear spatial and spectral resolution. But we, our focus is not to generate these final thematic maps of the mangrove species, is to explore this spectral relationship and how we can contribute to, to generate this information that is so dearly needed in economics. So, well, every, every single one of these pieces in these examples uh, say to us is that uh, the strongest response, the, the strongest signal or the characterized mangrove species is the one that is represented in every single species. So, these pieces, those rough pieces are related to the red mangrove, the sofran mangrove, and so on. That is the, what we are being uh, focusing on air force science, about how we can that correlate this spectral information, not just to generate uh, a thematic map, 
far as to, to better uh, get a deep understanding of these spectral relations. And in addition to that, uh, for every single uh, expedition, the methods have changed, the algorithm has changed, we have tried different combinations of processes, not just from the images, but the statistical analysis, how to generate the end members, and in, in revealing results for these in the study areas. This, in particular, the Uramba Malaga Bay National Park was very difficult because of uh, one week of fieldwork, the spectral radiometry yeah, and that was um, taken into, into this expedition uh, was damaged by the second day. So uh, we got very few signatures. But uh, even so, uh, when we uh, explore this analysis, this processing of the images and the spectral signature, you can see that there are some patterns of the, in the pixel distribution values that have indeed uh, uh, exalt a, a relation, a spectral relation of these two types of data. It might be not too accurate about us. Or let's say, I'm not saying that all the red pixels are definitely red mangrove, but there is, uh, in, in fact, uh, a relationship that, that it, it is indeed, in, there are indeed um, a, different, a spectral differentiation. Now, the last year was the latest in scientific expedition in the Gulf of Tribuga. And it's the largest in area we the we have worked so far, and we also have um, a very peculiar results in that are a promising results that we are still waiting to, or or, may, or better yet we are driving to validate our results. It is uh, the spectral differentiation. I like to begin um, to focus this result about here, of how this is tried to form. These extracts are related to the uh, distribution of the mangrove, the succession we, uh, succession we have in the different species, right? We expect that in, in terms of soil, in terms of the topography, and to have a, a, a different uh, distribution of the mangrove species. So uh, it's, a very, it's been a very promising result in that regard because we observe by the riverbank different species, different collection, different configuration, that uh, indeed in, in the classification we have been witnessing, witnessing. Now, the challenge here is how to uh, achieve a better, um, a highly accurate results from that. In that regard, we, in, we try different methods, as I mentioned, in boring statistics analysis and image processing. And uh, we're working probably on that um, yeah, um, in order to finish my presentation. A little bit of a conclusion and recommendation is vital uh, and mixed. Probably most people that uh, work with images, the atmospheric correction is vital. This is uh, a very complex issue because of the in, in the correction models it might vary from sensor to sensor. And the different example of the general area, uh, as you can see, is completely clouded. And um, yeah, this led to all, all new challenges in, in this type of data. So, um, in, and, and that's, it, that's it, that's what we wanted to share. Um, well, thank you. You have any questions? Thank you very much, Nelson. And thank you for keeping to time. Uh, so what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to go into our um, question and answer session directly with speakers. And we're going to start with Asua, with uh, Angie facilitating the, the questions. You have 10 minutes. Hey. Welcome everybody. Yes, I'm Angela Anyapara. I'm part of the core core team for the Climate Action Task Force. So I will be facilitating this program as Clarissa has mentioned, and we have a couple of questions for Asui um, on the QA session. So the question is from Na, and she says, in addition to free access, are there any other initiatives or strategies in place to promote awareness and utilization of CLMS data among stakeholders worldwide. How does um, Copernicus ensure the quality and reliability of the data provided through its dashboards? 
Thank you very much for the question. Um, well, indeed, it's one of the, the it's one of the focus now in the new. We are now in the new phase of Copernicus. The first phase ran from the launch of the services until 2021, and we are now in the second phase where we are consolidating the program, we are consolidating the portfolio of products, and we are also. And one of the focus now is on the user uptake and on the communication among the stakeholders. It is true that sometimes uh, we find it difficult uh, to communicate that the data are there, that they are free, and they are there, that can be uh, used by everyone. What we have is, we do have, uh, we engage in different trainings, we do webinars, we also have a general assembly, uh, of which Clarissa was the keynote speaker two, two years ago, uh, that this year will take place from the 3rd to the 4th of June. And it's going to be hybrid in Brussels, but also online. Um, so in short, we are uh, now in this phase of trying to increase this user uptake and trying to raise awareness. On the second part of the question, on how does Copernicus ensure the quality and reliability of the data provided through its dashboards? Okay, what we do is... Um, all our data are quality controlled and all our data are validated. By the time they are published, we don't publish data that have not been quality controlled. And we have uh, for our data, uh, we have very standard re um, requirements of quality uh, on overall quality of uh, of the product. Let's put, let's, uh, le let me give you an example. We are going to, a with uh, I think it's 85 to 90 percent of overall accuracy for for our thematic products, which is a standard in remote sensing the live products, and of course the dashboards uh, inherit this uh, quality. Thank you so much, Asuwe, for your very detailed answer. Can you hear me? Yes, I can see. I can hear you. Okay. I hope you've been, I hope now has been able to get some good answers to her questions. So then I would ask another question now that, okay, does the Sentinel-2 satellite, that's from Copernicus, which has the thermal infrared data, does it have night time data? Maybe when you want to monitor urban heat island for a particular location, you know, research has said that it's um, the best form to study LSD, that's the land surface temperature, is true the night time data. Mm -hmm. So does the Sentinel-2, which has an infrared um, sensor, does it have that nighttime data and is it, is it accessible around the world? Well, I, actually, it's a, it's a very, I have never thought about this question. Uh, very interesting. All the satellite, the, all the satellites acquire data night and night. Uh, of course, when we talk about Sentinel-2, since, since it is optical, uh, we usually only see the the day ones because they the ones that have that information. But I guess, and this is a guess, I have, I'm not, I have never tried to access this data. That the data acquired during nighttime is also available, and uh, specific especially for the thermal infrared because it would indeed be interesting to to have it. Mm, okay, okay, okay. That's good to know. Thank you so much, Susie. Then we still have like two more couple of questions before our time goes. This is given the strength, given the steady growth in climate awareness, what are some of the challenges facing the Copernicus land monitoring service? And how do you envision the future of these initiatives in terms of expansion and continuous improvement? Can you, can you repeat the, the first part of the question, please? Ah, okay. Can you please? Oh, okay. Can you? I was like giving the steady growth. Can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you, but it's a bit, uh, uh, sometimes it gets like cut. Oh, okay, okay. Given the steady growth in climate awareness, what are mm -hmm. some of the challenges facing the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service? And how do you envision the future of this initiative in terms of expansion and continuous improvements? 
Okay, uh, thanks. I, I think I, I, I got it now. Um, well, for, for the, the part of the land service that is managed at the, uh, at the European Environment Agency, as I said before, we are uh, deeply linked to uh, addressing uh, EU policy requests. So some of our products are specifically, uh, have been specifically designed to give a response to some of the some of the policies at EU level. And those are including the, the, the policies that are now uh, being, uh, that are now starting in the frame of the European review. Let me give you an example. We have a product which has been specifically designed to respond the land use, land use change and forestry regulation for, the, for Europe. At the global level, we have a similar situation with uh, with some of the with some of the indicators of the sustainable sustainable development goals. It is true that the uh, um, at the land service, I think that the main challenge is to ensure that we can give consistent information on the long term to make sure that the information like from our product it's reliable also on the long term which is essential when you link our product to a, policy, to a given policy. Uh, this challenge, this is especially challenging when you think about all the evolution and how remote sensing is evolving, which is very rapidly evolving in the, in the last years. When I am, I might look a bit old, but I am not that old. When I started working in remote sensing, we only had one image. And we have to do everything with just one image. And now what we see is that for a given classification, we are using at least 50 images. We are losing, using these huge composites. And of course, the result you get is very different. And one of the challenges is to make sure that we are up to speed with the technological development, including the potential changes to the, to the definition of the sentinels, in terms of, high, of having higher spatial resolution, which is something that is being discussed right now in the European Space Agency, uh, while at the same time not breaking the time series and making sure that we can give response to these policies that we are responsible for. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much, Mr. for your answer again. So we have another question from the Q&A session from Mr. Mm -hmm. Norman. He said, thank you for an informative presentation as well. Can Copernicus system monitor air pollution? Should it be able? Can it detect the epicenter of the pollution? Well, actually, this is already being done. The Copernicus atmosphere, uh, the Copernicus <laughs> atmosphere service already has information on air pollution. And actually, in cooperation with the European Environment Agency, at least for Europe, we have the air quality map. So we, we are monitoring in real time what the air pollution in Europe. But I know that there are similar air products at global level. So what I would encourage you is to check the, the website of the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service and see if, uh, the, because, I understand that these data are available and are accessible through their portal. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you again. So the last yeah. question, already had to on chat box, said considering this, that climate change is a scientific and policy issue, how can we link the climate actions we recommend to land policies? Well, uh, <laughs> this, is, this is a difficult one. Uh, well, it's it's not difficult, but it's, it is true that there's a, a there's a, a direct link between uh, the monitoring of land and monitoring it uh, um, also continuously and for long periods to be able to monitor the impact of some of the uh, of the climate actions that we are. Um, developing. In that sense, now the European Commission, uh, one of the things that when I, when I made my presentation, I said that one of the one of the drivers of the evolution of the service is the, the, the ecosystem or the umbrella under the European Commission. One of the things that they have now uh, decided to develop is to go from 
developing the services that are referring to a given topic and that are uh, somehow you could understand them, uh, understand it as, as, as boxes to developing more cross-cutting actions, uh, cross-cutting information or entry points for information on given topics. And we have one, this is what we call the thematic hubs, that they, they allow access to products uh, of different Copernicus services on given topics. We have right currently there are one, there's one on energy, there's one on health, on the Arctic areas, and there's also um, one on coastal areas. And in the future, there's going to be one developed uh, on climate adaptation, and there will also be one on climate security. That climate security will be more linked to the effects on security of the areas due to climate impact. So this is something that we are now trying to establish this link in Copernicus, while of course at the European Environment Agency, there are other links that are being uh, that are being created, not, not necessarily or not only uh, using Copernicus data. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. I hope um, Mr. Chibu Eugene has been able to get some insight into his question. So I would think I also want to round up the session so that we can give room for other questions for the other um, speakers. So thank you so much, Mrs. Isuwe, for your wonderful answers and contribution to this seminar. So I would quickly do like a wrap up from what we learned um, for the session. So basically, like I said, um, the presentation was very good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I don't know if we're even going to do our wrap ups of, uh, from our side because we've been running quite late now. Um, okay, and okay. It, and it, it, so think about doing a two minute wrap up when we've done the three uh, uh, questions and answers in the panel. Okay. All right. That'll be beautiful. So then I'll move on to Clarissa, who we then ask. Our we'll next give you time speaker. to think it through. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So now we uh, are going to have a look at Simon Peter. Are you with us, Simon Peter? Simon Peter, are you still with us? Yes, Clarissa, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. You better stay on um, video. Okay, so Simon Peter, you've got a number of questions actually in, in the Q&A. But I'm really conscious of time running. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, ask you a, a couple of grouped questions. And if you can try and keep your answers quite short. <clears throat> so one of the series of questions people are asking is, you know, um, in what, how does this uh, uh, community project fit into the National Land Administration system? And I, it would be great if you could explain how the 1998 Land Act works in protecting people's uh, rights at customary level um, and how the project fits into that and how you manage to lift um, the design of the project into influencing the National Land Administration system. And also how the project then within the National Land Administration system has been able to incorporate wetland approvals, resource management approvals at the same time. If you could uh, just give us your um, one or two minute answer on that, thank you. And thank you for the, for the question. So um, one of the things that I did not highlight um, but is really important to know, to put what I uh, presented into the right context is that um, Uganda, since um, many decades ago, has had um, a good policy and legal framework uh, in place. Uh, as Clarissa mentioned, since 1998, a uh, customary land tenure system is recognized in our law, and the law already provides for uh, legal in instruments uh, in the law. Um, along the continuum of land rights approach, uh, so um, with, with the idea to preserve uh, the customary land tenure in its form, uh, the law already provides for uh, three key instruments. One is the customary 
um, the certificates of customary ownership uh, so that any customary user, whether it's an individual or community, uh, they can apply uh, for a legal document to formalize their land rights. Um, the second instrument that uh, was already included uh, in the law is the uh, the communal land association. So uh, that uh, a group of customary land users, whether it is an extended family or a clan or um, a, a, a chiefdom, they can actually uh, incorporate, uh, legally incorporate themselves into a communal land association and therefore manage, uh, use that uh, to manage their land and natural resources. Process. Um, and the third one, which is also very important for me to highlight, is that uh, all this is really decentralized within our law, uh, and the law empowers local governments um, at the lowest level closest to the community to be able to issue these uh, documents and provide these land services to the community. However, the challenge has been that um, implementation, and that's why I say that um, with now the introduction uh, of the Propua land uh, tools and the gender sensitive, um, uh, you know, uh, gender sensitive land tools, it was possible for uh, for us to work with the national government and the local governments, uh, and uh, to be able to customize the land tools um, to the needs um, of of the different communities where we are working to the context, the customary context uh, in the different regions, and to be able to implement um, to be able to implement um, uh, the the existing policy and law. So what you can see is that this is already uh, actually uh, fitting in the existing uh, national land administration system, and 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 that's why uh, of course. Um, creating capacity at local government to be able to scale up to other uh, areas is really essential uh, so that it's not only happening in the selected areas where we are working, uh, but that this is rolled out at national level and this um, results into uh, secure land rights uh, and secure natural resource rights for all. I Great. hope uh, that answers the question. Thank you. Um, I'm actually drawing on a number of people's questions here, you know, including uh, Mary Amra and, and Jean Claude Hagizamana. And um, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, but we just don't have the time to focus on every single one of them. And um, I'm just one of the questions we got from Isaac Mutumurwa, if I pronounce you correctly, is so how did you go about getting the community buy in? Uh, so that we could not only get land management, but water resource management. Thank you. Um, if you could do that in a few minutes. Um, thanks, Clarissa. I think uh, that's really an important question because uh, in the beginning, we actually struggled uh, to build the trust between the communities, um, mainly because there was a, level, a high level of distrust between the communities and the local governments. Uh, but also there were a lot of people, uh, communities had experiences where in the past people came and promised to support them to improve their land tenure uh, rights. But in the end, uh, that resulted into uh, um, land grabs. So there was a lot of distrust uh, in the beginning. But I think that what is really critical is having a strong uh, community engagement uh, and awareness uh, strategy. And, and, and this strategy in our experience should not be a one of engagement. It has to be uh, continuous uh, throughout the entire intervention um, because there is even at different uh, stages of the project, there is always um, misinformation. Uh, there is um, you know, sensitization of the communities and then uh, you have also other interests coming in and uh, desensitizing the community. So there is a need for a robust um, community. Sorry, Simon, Peter, we've lost you. Are you with us? Hello? engagement uh, strategy, but also that um, the, the communities um, as, as um, 
Uh, this is really critical that communities feel that they are part and parcel of the process and that this is their process. Thank you, Simon Pierre. That's really useful. Um, we have a number of other questions, but we'll pick those up uh, during the uh, plenary session because we now need to move to um, Cromwell, who's going to talk uh, with Nelson about uh, what, he, what he presented. Thank you, Cromwell. You have 10 sure. minutes. Sure. Uh, thank you, Clarissa. Well, hello, uh, Mr. Nieto. I'm Cromwell again. Thank you very much for your love, your presentation. It was really um. Attention, attention, worthy. Well, um, I will. Ha I have some questions from the chat box, so I will bid up from them. Uh, starting from, um, Dinusha Jayarata, who was asking, can you please elaborate on what kind of challenges have you experienced during your project? Mm, well, first, of course, uh, logistical challenges. I mean actually getting to these areas most of them are very isolated zones insecure zones still in the country in Colombia um but is uh, from the Colombian Ocean Commission this uh, and the um, the Navy the National Navy of Colombia have a very close uh, collaboration in making sure the all the expeditionaries uh, the scientific personnel is secure and they can conduct their research, their experiments in these areas. As for the another uh, practical challenges in processing data and making spatial libraries is always very challenging, very difficult because uh, there are software limitations. Um, there are specific software rules and uh, that these licenses are very expensive, so we, we use uh, open open software. And but it is it, at this point is very standard. And most of the current processing of air observation data is done by programming Python R. But the uh, other set of challenges are more practical. I say is actually finding the the mangrove species we are interested. in. Uh, it's very difficult in, in mango forest. It's very hard to to move around. It's very difficult. Um, we have very limited numbers in, in the data. We can get this type of um, field observations. We, the optimal window is about 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, it's for in, entirely in relaxing the sun, in the, the local in relative humidity, the cloud covers. So uh, most of the time it's raining. In, in most cases, we we leave very early on the day and uh, hope for the rest because um, it's, it's completely unpredictable. So these are the main challenges in, in this type of research. Yeah. All right. So uh, what I understood from that is, um, aside from the scientific scientific team that uh this, that is working doing the hard work so you collaborated as well with the locals with the local community and the did you also um ask for help from some other specialists like some botanists in identify identifying the mangrove species in, in some cases yes there was an expert from WWF and we have a monitoring program for the past 10 years in Gozo Chubuga. Uh, and in other than that, the local leaders and uh, community leaders in uh, NGOs are uh, very helpful, and the and some representatives of the indigenous, indigenous populations. Right. So um, I I I uh, I'm I'll get um an, an insight from our from one of our audience, Sunjai, who was. Who was talking about you know um carbon capture? Do you think the uh, location, the special location of this mangrove species, is helping or helping in addressing the uh, um the climate challenges that you have in Colombia? Do, do they um do, do did you notice some um trends or some improvement if if ever you put another species near the one sixteen thing or I don't know the 
changes over time of the number of species uh, in those areas? Mm, well, mangrove forest is receiving a lot of attention because of blue carbon, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Carbon in the country several products for carbon mapping and carbon accounting. Um, but you know, what we observe so far is that um, it's an increase in deforestation in certain areas. So is the, the we've been observing a certain level of degradation of the mangrove forest. Um, it's not just through um, the land cover conversion for agricultural purposes, but also for um, in illegal uh, illegal crops, you know, and illicit drugs, is in cocaine, this kind of thing. But um, but there's small patches in, in Colombia, we know, so illicit um, crops. But um, and there is just um, uh, a higher vulnerability to a dry season, the extended drought, phases of drought. Um, the but there's also a couple of projects that one has 10, 15, and 20 years from altability and conservation of the forest, and especially in, in carbon footprint um, accounting. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. There's a lot of talk about, you know, carbon sequestration and how it is affecting our, um, our society, our natural assets, natural, cap natural capital. Um, given your experience in GIS as a GIS, GIS expert, um, could you highlight some technological innovations or advances that you have witnessed in natural resources monitoring and territorial studies? And how are these innovations are positively impacting environmental management? Well, um, definitely, in, um, as for the data accessibility, um, no time uh, as, as of now has been with uh, observation data has been so available. And it's very, uh, it's been very a creative development. Uh, people from universities, uh, research centers, uh, the government has been uh, coming up with a lot of methodologies, of processes, and ideas that are very creative in how to process and analyze information. Now we we're seeing a boom in artificial intelligence, but I say that is the most uh, important development. Yeah, where is your yeah, um, geographic information system or air observation? is how imaginative and how uh, maybe completive in, in the different researchers and, uh, and, and people in this area are coming with solutions, with new ideas on how to integrate these whole types of data. Uh, as uh, Mrs. Sue mentioned before, um, we, we have an enormous amount of information. We're not working with just one single image. We're working with terabytes even more terabytes of, of satellite data. And this is by far the best, maybe the best, one of the best moments to work with GIS and, and aerosolization data. Right, thank you very much, Mr. Nieto. I have a few more questions. Maybe we can just jump on them during the um, open forum, I guess. So I'm good. handing back to Clarissa. So. We can move forward with the program. I'll see you again later. Thank, thank you very much, Cromwell. So now we're going to move to uh, a, sum a summary by um, Angie and then myself and then uh, Cromwell of what we've heard uh, in the presentations and in the questions before we continue with the program. Thank you, Angie. The floor is yours for five minutes. Okay, Clarissa, thank you very much. Okay, so I'll just do a quick wrap up of what um, Sue had discussed with us. And from the questions, we were able to see that people were actually very enthusiastic and are now aware that we could actually get some, you know, insightful data from Copernicus using all of their platforms. You know, she emphasized on the land monitoring service, 
which is like a geoinformation system on land cover and its changes and how the Kenyan land use and vegetate in the vegetative states. Also, she talked about the water cycle and the earth surface energy variables on the European and global levels for environmental applications. So basically, we've been able to know that we have access to these data, data that could help us in our mitigation strategies. If you're looking at the urban space, you're looking at the water space. And through this, we really envision that we as um, enthusiasts or we as climate change, um, let's say fighters now, <laughs> try to make use of all of these data and see how best we can you know, make the world a better place. Back to you, Clarissa. Okay, well, that was quick. Thanks very much. I'm going to do a quick summary um, of uh, what we heard from Simon Peter. Uh, well, so this is what I heard. Uh, land and natural resources is politics. <laughs> and that's why surveyors had to become much more adept at dispute management at a number of levels uh, in order to uh, make sure that we can go forward, what, not only with uh, land governance and security of tenure, but also with the management of our resources. And that's a really difficult place to be. <clears throat> I also heard that uh, customary tenure is not a problem and, and it must be allowed to evolve. And it can, <clears throat> sorry, can accommodate climate issues. But what's very important is the legal and policy and regulatory framework and institutional framework of the country. And Uganda is very lucky because it has that. The other thing I learned is that all the things that we have learned about land governance and how to work with communities is also applicable to water governance. So we're not in a place where we know nothing. We have a great place to start, <clears throat> but also we need to thinking we need to be thinking about what are kind of wetland user committees and wetland management plans and so on. It's not just about land committees and land planning. Um, then the, the, thing, the thing that I also picked up is uh, it's not just about, uh, you know, this balance that we're having to make between uh, stopping wetlands from being uh, degraded and then what about people's food security? You know, these people don't have any cash. This the rice that they're growing is their only food. What on earth are our options in return in, in and how do we respond in terms of wetland protection? So this then comes down to the kind of issues that are being discussed at global level on loss and damage funding. And then uh, I really liked your causal loop diagram and your process for approval. Uh, I found that to be very, very useful. And uh, and your statement about how we have to develop tools that allow communities to control their lives while being linked into the national legal framework. Thank you, that's all from me. And I'm passing over to Cromwell for his summary. You have five minutes, Cromwell. Yep. So uh, what we heard from um, from um, Mr. Nieto and his team about this study on mangroves in, in Colombia is that in Colombia, we have some some issues regarding food security and livelihood and housing, first and foremost, maybe because of their location, and then second of all, from their geography. So we all know that mangroves is the champion when it comes to preventing coastal um, erosion, but they are uh, getting and getting more um, difficult to maintain due to climate change. So they implied applied some um, 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 some techniques in identification of mangrove species in three different um, areas. First, in two national parks in Gulf of Tribuga. Um, in this case, uh, they identified six species, which uh, the most prevalent one, if I remember right, was the red mangrove and followed by the black mangrove species. During this study, uh, Mr. Nyat and his team highlighted that there are there have been some challenges they had to um, face in executing the, the projects. First of all, sec uh, security during the survey and data collection. So they work closely hand in hand with um, the local community, the local government, and others uh, experts in the, in the area. 
also they also face some challenges regarding um, the cost of licenses. So they also in, applied um, open source data, open source resources. So they could provide um, a limit to the cost of this. Uh, the also, because maybe expect from their location, weather becomes unpredictable. I guess this is also an after effect of climate change that we can no longer <laughs> predict well what will happen if there's going to be rain in the forest. So they, they face these kinds of challenges in carrying out the survey. So um, uh, the, Mr. Nieto also uh, discussed that uh, re uh, recent advancements in data accessibilities and um, improvements in technology with GIS is causing um, a huge amount of data to be available for us to study. So, however, we still have a long way to go to uh, identify, to improve our techniques in identification of um, natural assets, natural capital. And maybe help even with the uh, policymakers and stakeholders in addressing uh, climate related issues within the community. Thank you, Clarissa. Great. Thank you very much, Cromwell. And now we are going to move to um, our, then the next session, which is uh, Dana's going to give us a five minute presentation showing us uh, what she has been seeing in graphic form of our seminar so far. Thank you, Dana. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a moment. I'm just bringing over the recording to uh, the right device. Spamit, Natsura. Sorry, I'm just having a small delay. So please put your questions into the Q&A, continue to do that, because Roshni will pick them up as we come into our plenary session after uh, Dana and then after Roshni's Kinefin uh, framework, uh, which will stimulate our minds, uh, because we, know we, we, we plan to answer all the questions. Thank you. Thank you for that, Clarissa. Um, so it's been a great discussion today. Uh, I'll zoom in here. Uh, if I can do this, yep, there we go. Um, so at the start here, Clarissa introduced us to the day uh, and we were focusing on opportunities and gaps for surveying and climate, really trying to learn and share between each other. Um, she really called out that surveyors are very much linked to land, water and marine climate impacts um, because land use planning uh, is very much linked to those um, those emissions uh, will play uh, surveyors will play a major role in implementing monitoring measuring evaluating um, and you know beyond all of that in coastal management be in water in marine and in land um, so we started then dive, deep diving into um, what's been going on on and around the world um, we had the um, Copernicus land management system introduction from Usue um, who really shared that this is global level of data is being captured with a, a robust quality to it um, to allow for this global level of free access data for everyone. Um, so great work from the Copernicus system. Uh, so going down, we explored the community-based approach for sustainable wetlands in um, uh, Butalic. Uh, apologies, I know I butchered that, uh, <laughs> that pronunciation right there, um, from Simon Peter. And uh, Simon Peter really shared again that the customary land rights is not a problem and that um, they're really working to bring this uh, this customary land rights sort of um, uh, process uh, through some uh, into a more uh, legal, <laughs> I guess, uh, process um, with some key project interventions around uh, security for particularly women and youth um, in their tenure, as well as um, inclusive climate uh, smart land use planning decisions, as well as um, improved awareness of customary rights and land plans and how they kind of connect together. Ultimately coming down to um, communities having a say and knowing they have rights while officials are able to balance their economic environment and social change goals together. Um, 
up the top here, we flew into uh, Colombia, where we explored mangrove forests and earth observations data. Now, Nelson, I will share, you gave me a uh, definite challenge with the technical data that you were sharing and the analysis that you've done. Um, so there'll be a couple of extra points to add in there. But I wanted to call out that, um, you know, these mangroves uh, are very uh, key to Colombian uh, food security, livelihoods and housing. Um, and that, you know, during your presentation, you shared a, a great little basic intervention um, of a simple measuring device that helped guide locals to improve their practices. So deciding if a mangrove clam was too small or too large and to best put that back if it needed to. Um, uh, a couple of other points coming out of that, uh, the group discussion at the very end there, I want to call out um, building trust in communities was uh, quickly spoken about um, and how uh, that's really critical to the complex work that we're doing uh, in land planning and all of our systems. Um, and that this trust is really built through raising awareness, uh, through continuous engagement throughout the project and pre, post potentially as well. Um, but really also understanding past experiences of communities that who um, potentially maybe have experienced um, some land grabbing or alternative um, adverse effects when people have come to try and talk to them. So that's a, a high level fly around again from all the discussion that we've got up to, to that now. I'll continue to listen and draw in the background and it's been a pleasure. So back to you, Clarissa. Oh, sorry, Roshni, back to you. Yes, Roshni, thanks for the kniff and now uh, go for it. And you, it's all over to you. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to share my screen now. And so today I will be speaking for you, to you for the next 10 minutes or so about a model for leading in complexity called the Kinefin Framework. So the Kinefin Framework is composed of four broad quadrants. I'll be walking you through these from the bottom right hand side in the clear quadrant up to the top right hand side in the complicated quadrant and then across to the top left hand side with the complex quadrant and then to the top bottom right hand side with the chaotic quadrant. So when we are in the bottom right hand side, oh, before I get into that, one second. On my um, this is how it starts. I don't know. So you'll notice that here we have a dashed line running through the middle, and on the right hand side we have known, predictable, and fact based, and on the left hand side we have unknown, unpredictable, and pattern based. This is an important um, definition that will help us to understand the landscape of this model. And this model really feeds into the mindset that we have when we are working on our projects, when we are working across the various ways that we show up as surveyors in our industry, and also helps us think about how we can approach the problem solving that we need to do in order to be as effective as possible. In the bottom right hand side, I like to think of it as when we go out into the field with our total stations or if we are doing a laser scan. We know exactly what we're going to get, it's easily re replicable, and we understand a clear relationship between cause and effect. Here, it's really easy to achieve best practice because things are replicable and we really understand what, is, uh, what the potential of information that we collect is, how complete it is, etc. As we move up to the top right-hand quadrant, the complicated quadrant, this is the domain where expert knowledge really comes to play. As surveyors, this is where most of us spend our time. Here, we're able to apply our expert knowledge 
and each time we apply it, it must be customised. Think of sending a rocket into space. We know how to achieve it, but each time we do this, there are situations that cause us to customise the way that we apply our knowledge to be able to achieve the outcomes that we want. This is the domain of experts, and unlike in the clear quadrant, we can't achieve best practice because there are so many unknowns each time. So this is the domain of good practice. I'd now like to move across to the right hand side of this diagram. In the top right hand corner, we have the complex quadrant. This is where we often deal with climate in terms of preparing for and mitigating climate risks. As surveyors, this is very relevant to us because in the future, instead of the complicated quadrant, this is where we are more likely to be spending most of our time. This is the domain of experiments. It's important for us to understand that often cause and effect can only be understood in retrospect as we look back. And so it is the domain of emergent practice. I'll explain more about each of these in the next slide. Finally, I'd like to go to the bottom left-hand quadrant where chaos reigns. This is the domain of rapid response and novel practice. Think of the COVID-19 pandemic. Think of being in the midst of a, responding to a climate emergency, a tsunami, a wildfire, whatever it might happen to be. Going more deeply into this, in the clear quadrant, it's really easy for us to understand exactly what needs to be done, how we can manage our projects, what tools we need to use, and when the timelines, uh, what the timelines are and how we get there. However, when it comes to the complicated quadrant, we start to need to streamline our processes and we rely on experts to share their knowledge and foster the capabilities of the team. Because tasks are often interrelated, the roles of strategies and roadmaps become more important here, as does project management. The structure of our teams means that teams which are led by experts and have some level of hierarchy result in the best outcomes. If we go across to the complex quadrant now, we see that when it comes to working successfully in the complex space, hierarchy does now become limiting. Leadership is more about leveraging the strengths of, and, and weaknesses of each team member to create an effective united whole that can solve the problem together. And leaders need to release bottlenecks and remove barriers to collaboration. Because the goal and the pathway to it are constantly evolving, we need to be much more comfortable with flexibility and emergence, dealing with uncertainty on a much more regular basis, meaning that agile methods of project and task management become much more important. Finally, when we are in the chaotic quadrant, all of the old rules go out the window. Here, leadership is just about keeping abreast of as much information as possible, working across a, um, what's it called? Working across a team that is not connected, that might not be clear in its structure and is quite dispersed. Leaders need to make informed decisions on the fly with whatever information that they have. And we rely on strategy, but more than that, we rely on instinct and experience. Planning doesn't work in the chaotic quadrant. So I'd like to then speak about what does this mean for surveyors? So things that we know. The earth system and climate science are moving at an exponential rate in multiple directions of theory and practice. For many of us, we have our work as surveyors and it can be hard to keep up with this, but that's okay. Two, the frequency and variability of climatic events is increasing rapidly over time and reaching many more places more often. Three, 
We are moving towards problem solving that is pattern based rather than fact based as our historic climate record and other records become less relevant to the future state requiring emergent practice and novel practice. What this means for us as surveyors. We are all familiar with detail, we love certainty, quantification, but we must get much more comfortable with zooming out to a systems level, dealing with uncertainty and emergence in our work. To help us achieve this, taking a systems thinking approach will help us to create better solutions. To help us to achieve that, we must embrace technology to help us to deal with the scales of data that will help us combat the increasing scales of the problems that we are solving. Also, it's important that we must not feel that we alone need to create the solutions, even though as an industry and a sector, we are both generalists and specialists. It's more important now than ever moving into the future that we lean on other disciplines and support them in their problem solving and also allow them to lean on us because we are stronger together. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rushdie, for that, uh, you know, really getting us thinking in a new ways. And, and let's start that now, uh, picking up the questions that you're going to now facilitate for the next 50 minutes uh, before we go to a final knefin and a closing. So uh, thank you. Please go for it. So I'd like to welcome all of our presenters back onto the screen now um, and also our facilitators as we work through this um, what I think is one of the most exciting parts of the seminar. For our audience, I thoroughly encourage you to now um, put any questions that you have into the Q&A. Um, if you can't access the Q&A, place them into the chat. And if you are comfortable, I thoroughly encourage you to go to the reactions button and raise your hand and we will ask you to unmute so that you can ask your questions of our presenters. So I would like to now um, ask the first question that we have. Uh, and this was put forward by one of our audience members, Eugene Chigbu. Um, I'd like to ask this first to Usue and then to Nelson. Um, considering that climate change is a scientific and policy issue, how can we link the climate actions we recommend to land policies? Yeah. Thank you, Rosny, but I think that I already answered that question in the previous. My apologies, my apologies. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> All right, so then um, I'd like to ask, do you think there are any special surveying skills needed for climate action? Is it about adapting our existing skills or do you think that there are new skills we will need to develop? But is, is the question for me? Yes, please. Because I am not an expert in surveying. So I am afraid I'm not the, maybe not the, the most appropriate person to answer that question. Absolutely. I might ask Nelson if he'd be willing to take on that question. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, from a, a biology, biological perspective, um, yes, definitely there is a need to uh, uh, a bigger picture kind of perspective. In, in, in all these types of data collection, in survey data acquirement. Um, we're going from the same measuring some properties, um, a caster, uh, utilization, and dating, but now we need to have a focus more more uh, the aspect of how this construction, how this survey can contribute to additional data. In Colombia, for instance, we have the multiple parts cadastre. 
the point is that the cluster is not is isn't only just to um, tax for uh, surveying how big uh, an um, an urban area is or how how many how much to charge in, in the tax, but how this information can be applied to every other type of um, national necessity, where the climate change, climate uh, validity, and land administration. So um, I mean, it is necessary to, to really begin this begin this picture of how to how to how this type of data correlate into the environment and climate action. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Nelson. Okay. I'd like to pass to Na now, who has a question that she'd like to ask. Thank you, Roshni, and um, wonderful presentation from all our presenters. So my question is to any of them. Um, as an academic, I'm interested to know what our role, what the role of academic and training institutions how can they play a role in this capacity building in the area of climate action? And if there are roles for us, where, where are the key areas we should focus on? I'm interested. Um, I wonder, Usue, if you might have any insights into how Copernicus data might be being used by universities in their teaching? Well, we have currently, there are, there's the initiative Copernicus Academy, uh, where some research institutions have, um, have signed up uh, freely. And then what they, they commit is, uh, it's not, it's a soft commitment. Eh? to use uh, Copernicus, but also to contribute. We have, however, within the Copernicus program and within the European Commission program, we do have research uh, projects and we have a research uh, agenda and a roadmap. And um, there are what we call the previous age 2020, where they are now called Horizon Europe projects, where we, we give uh, from the Copernicus side, what we do is, Give our express our needs for for future development of products of our for that could be useful for our services, and there they are checked and they in and they are also tested tested uh, looking for their operationality because as I said before, what we do is operational products and this means that we are we know they will work we know they will have the required accuracy and we know that they are repl replicable. I'm curious, uh, and b before I ask this question, I, I wanted to reach out again to anybody who is in the chat um, who would like to ask a question. Again, please feel free to raise your hand. Great. Mary, um, I'm wondering if you might be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to ask this question. Can we have new help tools that will be needed for climate change in building a resilient climate change if we get any new tools for that purpose? Uh, would you mind repeating your question, please? So I believe um, Mary's question was around um, new tools for climate. Um, Nelson, I wonder whether you might be able to take that question. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Where? thank you. Okay, so in new tools in climate action as in surveying, information, data collection. Okay. Well, there is um, what, what I have mentioned about high spectral data or um, 
Uh, let's say other types of information in biophysical information, the phenology state of the vegetation, specifically in regarding vegetation and the ecosystem behavior, let's say, um, and the study of ecosystem services, finally, I mean, is for the well be climate regulation or food security. Um, there is constantly uh, improvements in different types of sensors, different towers of observation, for instance, that use spectral data, different spectrum for this, um, and like, uh, I forget the word, uh, monitor, monitoring gas emission, for instance. There is a, a currently in Colombia and a lot of projects that have been working in, a lot in the, the inventory of in, in emission, uh, the gas emission from uh, global warming emissions. So these uh, these kind of technologies and devices are being <clears throat> and are more efficient currently, are better designed, and they are part in monitoring uh, stations in certain mangroves here in Colombia in different types of ecosystems. So this information, in, and let's say a couple of decades ago, and like in the eighties or nineties, was very rare. We never heard of, of this type of technology, but now it's more it's more common, and, <clears throat> and we we find these uh, these experts that come to Colombia, visit the universities, visit the private sector, the the um, different uh, government agencies, and uh, present these technologies. So it's it, it's a very good time also to this type of uh, new devices, new methodologies, new emails, new sensors. So yeah, the, I, I leave the point is to be in, on the lookout on what is currently uh, the, the state of the art, uh, what type of technologies are measuring, what variables, ecosystem variables. And this type of uh, research, there is a very, uh, I find that the research community is very open to share their, their, well, their research. So they're very open and and I believe that that is the key here about how to stay up to date uh, and being aware of, of these new tendencies in, in climate and science. Thank you very much, Nelson. Um, we also have um, a question here for you uh, from one of the audience members around are there any specific GIS tools or software platforms that have proven particularly effective in enhancing natural resource monitoring or territorial studies? Mm. The first thing I, I could think it would be some specific plugins or add-ons for uh, QGIS. Um, from there are uh, a few set of uh, that I have seen in in cluster uh, updating for cartography purposes. Um, some more innovative ways to update cartography. What we all know uh, is image segmentation with geo geo AI, artificial intelligence applied to the, classif the classification images and uh, the famous SAM segment editing model from Meta. Um, this has a very interesting, interesting potential, but uh, I wouldn't recommend rely on the plugin or the software itself, but more about the method methodology, the algorithms, the how they use it, because uh, software is always evolving. Then someone is always contributing to something, let's say, more up to date, more efficient, and uh, uh, most people are programming now <laughs> and in, in GitHub we can have access to a lot of scripts, a lot of alternatives. So I will be um, I will be foc more focused on this type of research and not so much for the software because uh, uh, this as, as surveying goes, we know we have the GPS, we have the station, the geodesic station, all these devices that 
are very precise, but they are what they are, and they, and they, are, they are tools. But uh, for going beyond that, we need to rely more in processes, in methods, in, in uh, I think more in creativity than devices, as, at least as, that's, a, that's how I see it. Thank you very much um, for that very comprehensive um, and <laughs> thought-provoking answer. Really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to hand over now to Na, who I believe has a question for Usue. Yeah, hello. Yeah, so I would like to know, as surveyors, are there any special skills that we need to acquire in order to contribute towards climate action? So this could be answered by anyone. I think you know. I think I think this was already answered by Nelson. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, uh, now I I you've placed a question um into the Q and A about the steady growth of climate awareness. Maybe if you'd like to ask that one. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I see, I, I, I was reading the, I was reading the question. What I see is that I think that it was already, I think we already uh, answered it um, because we, we, we talked about the, the evolution of the service and, uh, and how to link it with the policies. Um, All right, no problems, yeah. thank you. Um, Cromwell, I can see you've got a question. Uh, you oh yeah, Great. yes. No, actually, it's not a question. It's actually, can you hear me? Yeah, it's not a question, but I guess an answer to Na in her question about what special skills does a surveyor need for climate actions. In my opinion, I think, first of all, we need to be resilient in, for, in working, <laughs> in doing our, uh, in providing our expertise. Second is to be able to communicate our ourselves, so to be able to convince policymakers, stakeholders, local communities, other technicians, the academia, uh, the, um, the national councils, even maybe the FIG at this point. We really have to be vocal about what we can do as surveyors in help in helping climate actions, in determining climate related interventions. Like what we're saying today in the previous um, webinars, we don't have all the answers. We have some. We must be able to communicate them and put it out there for everyone to be useful. And that's a really good point, um, you know, Cromwell. I think that it leads on to another great question that we have, which is what do you think are the biggest challenges that we face at the national and the local levels because they can be quite different when it comes to undertaking climate action. We've heard from some of our speakers today about different um, challenges at each of these different levels. How can we take a coordinated approach between government and non-government at different scales? Um, I'd like to open that up to anybody. If I may, I can I can start maybe the, the answer. This is something because this is uh, actually it's one of the the big issues we face with the land service. Um, and I will put a, a, a very specific example. We are um, we are producing at European scale, and that means that when when you produce at the European scale, you will of course have to find the trade-off between the quality for the whole area, and that stands also for for the global uh, product. And this has uh, th this has cost in the past, and also it's still ongoing a conversation ongoing with countries on how ca could they, if they could ingest their data in our product. 
And our, our answer is always no. And the reason for this is that we need to keep the coherence across the whole area. So if you would have, um, I'm Spanish, so I know that the Spanish uh, Geographical Institute is very strong in some of the data. And of course, we could enhance our products in Spain, but that would make the different, that would make them not comparable to other countries in Europe. And that would, this is an example that would stand for, for, for any other places in the world. And it happens, it happens to us the same at city level, because we are also trying to work more at city level since uh, there are a lot of actions on climate adaptation that should take place at city, at city level. So uh, I, I honestly do not have the answer to this. Uh, I see that someone answered empathy, which is actually is key for this, to start a very honest conversation with all the stakeholders and say, okay, I, I see your point. I understand you have, might have better information, but we are trying to address a policy which is at European level. And maybe it's not a matter of which product is uh, better, in quality, but it's a matter of saying, okay, which product is fit for its pur for the purpose of of something, and you might have a very good information at the local level, which is fit for its purpose, but it's not fit for ours, and that also needs to be understood. Would anyone else have anything they'd like to contribute to that? So Usue, we have a question in the chat um, from Norman, who's curious about uh, a, a use case of the Copernicus system. So Norman has asked, can the Copernicus system monitor air pollution? Would you be able to tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, so uh, as I said before, there is indeed air pollution monitoring by the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. So I, I encourage, I can put the link to their web uh, in the chat. Um, on top of that, for Europe, we at the European Environment Agency have developed an air, air pollution uh, map, uh, air pollution, I think it's called actually air quality map uh, for the whole of Europe, which is monitoring in near real time the quality of the air. So yes, I will put now, I will write now the, the link to the to the monitoring to the atmosphere monitoring service, okay? And I'm curious to also understand um, you know, if you had one message for somebody who would like to use earth observation but maybe hadn't started yet um, what would you tell them about the potential that it has or how easy it is or how they can get started because you mentioned some really great um, tutorials um, in your presentation how could they develop the confidence to get started well, currently there are in currently there are a, a lot of free accessible uh, tutorials and demos and massive open uh, online courses that can be followed. Uh, so it's not like when I started my my degree that it was um, not that accessible. I would say I think that nowadays everyone has almost everyone has uh, access to uh, an internet connection and to a laptop and with that you already can do a lot. I'm thinking now and I am not going, it's not, I don't want to to keep publicity to a, to a company, but I remember I, 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 I followed quite so many massive open online courses from ESRE, RI, ESRI. I've always said ESRI, so I don't know. Um, and at the same time, we are at the Copernicus, we also have training. It is true that uh, nowadays, what I've seen is a, diff, uh, a change in the paradigm. When I studied uh, remote sensing, there was a lot of focus on the, um, on the fundamentals of what could be seen in an image. And so understanding the physics 
Uh, and that is still relevant, of course. It is also very relevant if you are working with radar data. But I, my personal feeling is that nowadays, uh, it, you don't need to have all that background to be able to do something with optical information. And since we have freely available satellite imagery, it shouldn't be that difficult. Of course, if you want to carry out more uh, specific or um, more difficult uh, analysis or more uh, uh, or higher level of uh, if you want to give response to different policies, then you will need to have also this this background. But uh, I, because I remember when I started, I had to program a lot, and this is right now that is not that much needed. That is this is yet an example. So uh, what I would say is. We should, uh, that I encourage people not to be afraid of it. It's easier than what it seems. Uh, I think that currently we are all more or less uh, used to seeing image, satellite images in Google Maps or something. So it's not that we are so, so much afraid as we were in the past. And of course, then you will need to have uh, some, um, some previous knowledge to be able to interpret what you are seeing. So not to make mistakes on interpretation. That was a brilliant answer. Thank you so much, Isue. Um, I now have a question that um, Claire Buxton has asked, um, and it's about customary land rights. And I'm hoping that Clarissa, with her many decades of experience working, uh, doing leading work in the field on this, might be able to answer this, please. Um, what is the appetite for both the government, so national and local, as well as the customary land right, customary right holders to retain the customary land tenure as it is? Um, I'm wondering if you could include what incentives there are to remain customary and what financial arrangements might be available um, or examples, whether uh, Uganda or other, um, in terms of individualized tenure. Thanks. Well, thanks very much for that question um, that I'm going to be taking on behalf of Simon Peter. So um, yes, there are some uh, very successful uh, programs in Africa for customary tenure, uh, where Uganda is a very good example. And well, depending on how you want to define customary, um, Ethiopia has more than 20 million parcels and so on. But the reality is uh, in an African environment, but also across the global south, uh, only 70%, let me put it this way, uh, only 30% of people's land rights are actually in the, in, in the government system. 70% are outside the government system. So we're talking about 4 billion rights being outside of the government systems. And it really, there is no ways, um, when we talk about this ourselves as land people, there are no ways that this is going, this figure is going to change in the near or the medium future. In fact, with climate change, it could get worse with all the uh, display, displacement that is that climate is going to cause. Um, but, you know, so customary tenure, say 20, 30 years ago, everybody said, oh, we have to individualize. We have to do a title registration. Well, that hasn't happened, and it's very unlikely to happen except where the value of land goes up. Um, this means that customary tenure is becoming increasingly important um, as an option because it's perhaps the only option that many people have and will only have in the future. But now this is what's really becoming important is we are seeing that up to 20% of countries are being allocated now for carbon offsets, whether it's Tanzania, Zimbabwe, Zambia, and so on. It's becoming so important that there is now a conflict, a continued conflict between what we would call customary rights, which are often held as public land, statutory rights, which say are the title registered land, and between the, the government and the uh, tr uh, the chiefs and uh, the community, the customary people on the ground. Now, because of carbon offsets is just happening nowadays, um, we're just starting to see uh, African governments put in place 
uh, laws in order to manage this car these carbon offsets and receive the revenue from them. And uh, it's not clear how this revenue is being shared with the local communities, if at all. And we've heard I've heard some people talk about how um, it's only being say shared with the chief. The uh, local community is not getting it at all. So we're seeing another layer now coming on top of customary tenure. So all these, but this balancing act we're talking about about who has right, what rights where, and you know how do we do the dispute management between it is really critical at this time in Africa and is only just starting to come onto the table. So thank you very much. Thank you, Clarissa. That that was a very very thought provoking response there as well. Um, I'd now like to uh, go to Gordana, who has a question. Over to you, Gordana. Thank you, Roshni. I would have a, do you hear me? Uh, I would have a, the question or more comment for you, Sue. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce your name correctly, but uh, I'm interested on your opinion about practical application and usability of Copernicus data and Copernicus services. Of course, that uh, European Commission and Com Copernicus program done great job introducing services in order to provide to users, uh, let's say, ready to use data. Uh, but uh, somehow I think that the practical application, for example, in monitoring, let's say, uh, just one example is application in monitoring of the water quality for the European Union. Uh, framework directive is not, those data are not still implemented, uh, in my opinion, in the level that uh, it could be. Uh, do you share my opinion and what is, um, what would you say that it, it is the main uh, reason for for that, if you, if you agree? Yeah, I, I, I do share your opinion. It's true that for the water quality, we do have some uh, we do have some products at global level, but of course they are in a very in a lower spatial resolution. Uh, and it is uh, it is a good example, by the way. Um, so first of all, uh, one of the we what we found, I think, in the first phase of the Copernicus Land Monitoring Service, uh, and if you actually if you look at our products, you see that we have indeed a ready to use data. And this, what this cost is that maybe more uh, avoided audience was able to use it to use them, but then the the more specific uh, the, the more expert users were not using it, and um, because they wanted to derive their own things with their own methods, or maybe because the definition we were using was not that uh, relevant. I will give you an example. We have a high resolution layer on grassland. Uh, then we were deriving our layer, which was grassland, that was using a given definition. This definition was uh, useful for some areas, but not much for others. But it was given a, 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 an information at, at European level. What we are now doing is we are produ still producing that layer in case uh, we have some users that are using it, but we are also producing other layers that allow you to derive your own grassland according to your grassland definition. So we will produce a, a, a layer called herbaceous cover that combined with other information that we will also produce will give the opportunity to more expert users to use it. This is an example, uh, and in that sense, what, what this means is that we are trying to increase the usability of our products because we know that there is an issue with the uptake of our products. Um, and to me, my personal feeling, and since I was not here, I can, I can say it, but I'm not trying to blame anyone, uh, is that uh, there were stakeholders who were maybe not properly um, um, Pointed. What I want to say is that they we were trying to create products that could be uh, used uh, by a too wide audience, and that means that you might uh, risk not having something that can be used by uh, by most of them. 
And I think that that might have happened uh, in, I have two specific uh, examples in my mind. Further to you, following your question specifically on water quality, um, there was a problem to derive water quality parameters, which is a special resolution of the data used for it. And uh, the fact that in Europe, uh, you don't have, I mean, our rivers and lakes are not so big, and then the, the water quality, well, it's, it's not that well depicted. I know that now um, the European Space Agency has created, uh, has uh, searched for increasing what they call the contributing missions. So the missions, the satellites that are beyond Sentinel. And uh, one of, we are exploring with one of them that made it to this contributing mission, the option to have something operational for water quality at European level. But of course, it will, this will entail that it will take time until it is there. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Isue. Um, I'd like to now pass over to Na, who has some questions for Nelson. Okay, um, Nelson, uh, basically I'm interested in your project and I wanted to know uh, some of the specific findings out of your project. Okay. Um, what kind of specifics like, um, well, um, we were able to identify um, the spectral difference between five to six uh, mangrove species in Colombia. There are the main uh, mangrove species uh, well documented here in Colombia. Mm. I gotta say that uh, one of the findings is uh, we're working mainly with red tide and flame spectral radiometers that covers the 350 nanometers to 1000 nanometers. That's mainly the visible range and the near infrared. This is very, um, it's a very important range for vegetation studies, but for further characterization and differentiation at, at the species level, is still a little short. We will need the uh, at least the short wave infrared uh, from 12,000 nanometers and so on. Um, th that's one one of the main uh, findings. Uh, another finding is that the spectral difference between different stages of this mangrove species, this the, the at the individual level uh, and the specimen especially is very confusing, spectrally speaking, with um, intraspecies. I mean, um, red mangrove, white and black mangrove can be very similar spectrally uh, since the species is, is, is young, is growing, has uh, some water deficient, uh, etc. So it is very important to, when we are comparing this type of data, to make sure that we're comparing the right features. I mean, we're not uh, doing it right if we're comparing a young red mangrove against a uh, old uh, white mangrove. Is it secondary vegetation? Is it uh, uh, some sort of ailment or deficiency? These uh, are very important findings as well. Mm -hmm. For the classification, um, the one of the main uh, limitations we have is that is that the, uh, the best image currently is planet scope uh, for a year, just uh, a specific year, uh, or better yet, uh, a year, an image for a year. But um, we don't have a currently supply of images. So uh, we have about a two to three months difference between the capture of the image and the capture of the field spectrum. That's also a big issue too. Um, we're trying, uh, or we 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 are thinking of trying to analyze different types of images, like Sentinel, for instance. But uh, we will be going from ten meters to ten meters, and so on. So we would need to change a lot of, of things to, to make it work. Um, okay. yes, that's that would be my main recommendation about the specific findings. 
Okay, thank you. One last question. Uh, looking at your work, uh, you would require a lot of um, community knowledge. So how are you able to navigate between the scientific knowledge you acquire from the geospatial analysis with that of the community knowledge? How are you able to put them together seamlessly? Mm, well, uh, I believe the key is uh, well, when when you are approaching any type of or any kind of community uh, with the with it, doing it with the utmost respect and kindness, and they help you all the way. They are these communities are very nice, are very kind, are very knowledgeable. Maybe they don't know the scientific names for the species, but they know everything they there is to know about the red mangrove, for instance. When to cut it, when to harvest it, when when it's right, when it has some kind of disease, uh, they know exactly where they're going to to sail, to uh, how to drive the boat. They know pretty much everything. And once you uh, you have a this how how can you say when maybe there is some discrepancy about the scientific community and the more rural more uh, rural communities about this disparity on, on knowledge or, or academic formation, for instance. But when you're just kind, you're, uh, you're noble, you're humble, and you go all, all the way. They, they become your best friends and, and you learn a lot. I mean, there's, there's an amazing amount of knowledge that you can acquire from local communities. And it's not very hard. I mean, at, at least for me, you, you just uh, talk. You just talk and then you start to develop a connection with them and and from that you, all you have is to learn be able to allow yourself to learn from from them and and it's very helpful also to teach them to uh, perhaps you know, they don't have much experience working a computer how a spectral emitter works but you tell them and they just get it back and and also that's very helpful incredibly helpful um, there's, I, I say that, uh, that there's a lot to learn uh, to teach and to collaborate, and it's an amazing experience. Thank you. Because. That was really, really um, encouraging there, Nelson. You know, <laughs> consulting with um, Indigenous groups is always really meaningful, but can be really difficult as well. Um, and showing up with respect and communicating uh, humbly with them is just so important. Um, we have a question here um, from Norman to follow on with the, what you just mentioned there, Nelson. He's asked, which instrument was used in capturing the vegetation signature and index of the mangrove and how accurate was it in differentiating the species of the various mangroves? Well, uh, that's a multi-part question. Uh, I mentioned the, the spectroradiometries we use. We also have an ASD field scope 4. It goes from 350 nanometers to to have the 2,500 nanometers. Uh, but we haven't been able to use it properly on the field. Um, so we rely up to the near infrared in, in, in infrared range. Mm, as for the precision of the results, uh, we found, uh, I didn't include it in the presentation, or um, a, bit, a little bit on the paper uh, that we submitted to the FIG in event. Um, as for the, uh, the differentiation between at the hyperspectral level, level, sorry, um, we found that uh, the we, we made a lot of uh, we implemented a lot of different uh, statistical methods, and basically the the second derivative of the spectral the end members uh, had the better results discriminating spectrally the different spe uh, species, about um, eighty. 75 to 80 percent of confidence rate, but uh, at the hyperspectral level, mm, that is not a detail on the well in the presentation and that paper because we need to 
get a little bit uh, deeper in this type of analysis because there is an uncertainty still in the in the data the data collected. And as well, or better yet, as much as the classification of the images. Um, as you may have noticed in the presentation, I didn't include uh, the validation results, like uh, per uh, the percentage of precision or accuracy, because it's a delicate subject. We don't, we can just say we map the, the entire species, mango species of the Colombian Pacific, because that might lead some some confusion. So uh, in those type of results, we are more discreet with, but because we want to make absolutely sure we have the best results, and we are still working with uh, the validation, the, the analysis of the results in order to have a better uh, a, a quality, a, a product of a better quality, so we can start talking about this kind of precision and accuracy. That helps a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs> and so we are very soon going to be wrapping up this plenary section um, as we're brainstorming here. Just before we do, I have one final question for our presenters. What do you think are the biggest gaps and opportunities when it comes to climate? that might be relevant to surveyors over the coming decade? It's a big question, and I don't expect you to have all the answers, but we'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, what you think might be possible. Perhaps Nelson, if we could start with you. Okay, so... Um, if I understood correctly about the next couple of years and challenges of surveying and climate change and the current tendencies, right? <laughs> okay. Um, as I see it, um, there is um a wider and more generalized um process of learning or acquiring, acquiring the responsibility with climate, with the climate in general, with our environment. I believe this work in the, all this you know, back from the 90s with Rio de Janeiro, uh, all this climate change action, it is working in, in the education field, the education department. And there is a higher level of uh, how conscientious people are about the impact with the environment. Uh, so I'm, I'm a little bit hopeful in, in that regard. As for science and technology, there are some challenges of, of science as um, accepting science. And these past couple of years with, with the pandemics and the, all, all this, all this stuff, all these controversies, it is it is worrisome as, at some extent. But uh, also science denial just brings saying. Is, is worrisome also, but I'm hopeful in the sense that um, it is easier, there are more tools, uh, more media to learn from, to, to exchange ideas, to collaborate, to, to learn and to teach. So um, I, I would say that I'm, I'm hopeful, and uh, the fact that there are some uh, in Special, special programs, satellite programs like Copernicus that are that give the information free. It has just been extremely helpful and is branded or has made an entire generation of people that are, are on the subject, that are learning, that are teaching, that are contributing. And, and I believe that is that is a key. Many many countries countries that have these challenges with can share the information don't have the special programs, so to rely on this type of information. And that just I believe mean, is the cornerstone to to really come together for the next couple of decades to to really contribute to you know the adaptability and alleviation of climate change as I see it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very well considered answer and, <laughs> and for giving us hope 
because that is sometimes <laughs> the most important thing. Um, Usue, what are your thoughts on what maybe some of the most significant challenges might be in terms of climate over the next 10 years or so? Um, that, that it, it, I, I have to say, I have to be honest, I am, I, I always, uh, um, I always try to refrain myself to to answering that type of questions because I don't consider myself an expert on the topic, and, and so I think that there are always some people who are um, better positioned. I think that one of um, one of the other values, and Nelson just mentioned it, is um, we live indeed in a in a in in a time where we have access to a lot of information. And when we talk about facing the challenges related to the climate change, it is, of course, having access to, to information that is freely available. Uh, and, and I want to highlight this freely available because this, I think, lies a, a bit in the core uh, of the idea behind Copernicus and the idea of, yes, doing going on a transition, but being, making it a just transition. So um, the possibility to have for all of us uh, to have information which is available free, which is uh, consistent, which is coherent, where you have the commitment to make, to to keep it going, it is one of the major uh, uh, advantages we have now because indeed the challenges we are facing are huge, and uh, I can. Coming from Spain, I, I, which is, I think, is considered one of the countries most affected, or it's expected to be really affected by climate change, and we have already seen it. I can tell you um, that it's not going to be easy. But indeed, I would like to 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 also follow what Nelson was saying. And we need to have hope because if we do not have hope, we will not try to change things. So. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lissue. I'll now pass to Clarissa for the closing. Thank you very much, uh, Roshni, for uh, doing that for us. Before we go to the closing, we have to uh, have another look at Dana's um, live scribe. Sorry, Dana, I forgot to give you a, a warning <laughs> that it was coming up. But, I'm uh, all ready had... to go. Great. Good planning. We've had an incredibly rich session, really digging down into some of the details, which is what the, the intention of this is. And, and thank you that you've asked the, the speakers those detailed questions because they are such experts and we are lucky to have them. So go for it, Dana. All righty. Um... This is the, the, the current draft. Of course, I will continue to publish this and finalise this. Um, all three artworks will be available to um, all the participants so you can explore, remember and share what you've sort of talked about across uh, the several seminars. So let's zoom into the, kin uh, the Kynafin, um presentation. I'll just quickly take us through our final points of our discussion. Um, and then uh, let you guys go over to your task force meetings. Um, so Roshni shared that the Kynafin model is a leadership and uh, a leadership model for leading in complexity, um, but really is talking to the mindsets needed that uh, towards the future. Um, the Kynafin model explores uh, embracing uh, uncertainty. Uh, it explores empowering decisions in chaotic spaces, as well as embracing new capabilities needed to deliver uh, deliver work in increasingly complex spaces, such as climate action, which we know falls into this sort of chaotic um, the, the chaotic quadrant of the kind of model. Uh, as Roshni had sparked us with some great thinking there around how do we push our thinking in this space? Um, you guys opened into some great discussion reflecting on the role of academics and education. Uh, you know, I'll call through these points. So the role of, academic, uh, of academics really uh, called out um, their role to not only teach the upcoming uh, workforce, uh, you know, the, to contribute and use these expert systems such as Copernicus, uh, 
They also want a company to listen to industry on what and how they need for future uh, innovations. Um, when we uh, go down to new climate technologies, there's always new sensors, new things coming out. Um, and so it was just a call out there to look out, um, keep an eye out what's being released, keep an eye on your government, your industry body leaders. Um, and again, back to academics as well. They're always got new things coming out. Uh, we then sort of again started digging in, into the future skills and um, uh, what that's going to need, uh, particularly uh, for the future. We called out the, the need for surveyors to be resilient as people for the work that needs to be done, uh, to communicate to others um, and really kind of uh, becoming comfortable in understanding which products are fit for pur purpose. Um, we shared a, a little story around local Spanish data might work locally, um, but might not necessarily work in France because of the quality differences between those two countries. Um, we jumped into customary rights again, uh, and uh, just the tensions and that kind of arise in that unique space. Uh, and then um, ultimately just get, getting a bit of confidence to start using these new earth data. Just jump in and have a go in all of these different spaces and skills, whether it's satellite data, earth data, to um, communication and engaging with indigenous peoples. Um, there was one last point there that was said in the um, in the final comments of the, of the seminar, which was uh, the need for hope. I have been recording in various uh, climate spaces and this seminar has been very hopeful for me in seeing all the various case studies um, across the world and across local to you know national government scales. So thank you for sharing. Thank you for having me on board and keep an eye out for the artworks. They will be coming out shortly. Back to you, Clarissa. Thank you. Dana, we really honour you for all your voluntary work. Thank you very much. Okay, so now um, we're just going to go into the closing. Um, and uh, remember that we have recorded this and it will go on to our Climate Compass Task Force YouTube channel for you to uh, share with everybody. And uh, we just want to thank uh, our speakers for a wonderful job well done. And also our backup team, Angela Anyakora, Cromwell Manolotto, uh, Na Tedo and uh, Gordana, Gordana Javalovici. Oh, sorry, Gordana, tried that one. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, Roshni and Dana herself. Now, um, we invite you to join our Climate Compass Task Force LinkedIn page where we post blogs of relevance um, on climate actions and where we ask, you know, why did you start participating in that LinkedIn um, uh, page. We also um, remind you that this is the first set of seminars that we're doing. We'll do another one set in 2025, but in the meantime, we'll run a couple of webinars. So if you're on our um, Climate Compass uh, LinkedIn, you'll see uh, on the upcoming webinars where we'll have, which will run for one and a half hours with three speakers. We also have a number of climate events at the upcoming FIG Working Week in Accra and Ghana in May, which will include papers on climate uh, workshops where all the findings from this seminar will be presented through um, our CUP committee uh, as panel discussions uh, and, the, and, and the live scribes that Dana has produced. And so we can encourage people to come on the journey with us and to find solutions as we go forward. Um, as I said, the recording will be posted on the YouTube channel alongside our other events. Um, and, uh, you know, you're welcome to become part of this task force. All you need to do is fill in a short form. It's now available, hopefully, in the chat box. Um, and, of course, if you want to stay for the next part of the meeting, which is uh, the task force meeting itself, uh, you're absolutely welcome. But of course, you know, we've been at it three and a half hours. If you if you want to step off, we do understand. Um, from our side, it's been incredibly rich. We really want to thank you as a committee uh, for committing your time, especially to the speakers, three and a half hours, four hours, long time. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future. And now uh, we are going to transition through to our task force meeting.